Hey, Jeff, can you hear me? Okay. My, yes. my computer has been a little wonky, so. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Yep. And David uh, Lee, I assume you can hear us okay? Yes, sir. This is Mr. Albright, thank you. Hey, David, am I morning. coming in loud? David, this is Peter Gould. Am I coming in loud enough? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Good morning, Judge. Yeah, good morning, David. Uh, let's uh, let's go on the record. It's nine o'clock. Uh, we're back on the record. Uh, I have no nothing preliminary this morning. Uh, if no one else does, we can start uh, immediately with the uh, testimony. But I see Mr. Gould's raising his hand. Mr. Gould. Yes, Mr. Shanauer, we did check with Mr. Gorman. He is available after 1 p.m. Mountain Time today. Okay. And he will be standing by. He'll be on this, the, as I understand, he'll be on the YouTube. So he'll be seeing the progress of the hearing. Um, it shouldn't take longer than a couple of minutes to get him on board if he can come today. And then if he needs to come tomorrow instead, he's willing to, uh, to do that as well. Oh, great. I appreciate that flexibility. Mr. Mr. Hearing Examiner, Richard Virtue, uh, yes. Mr. Arthur and Mr. Tumorello, uh, you ask about their availability today. Uh, they are available from 11 to 2 today or after 4 if you want to try and work them in. Otherwise, they're available all day tomorrow, which was their originally scheduled time. Okay, and they're both in California. And I would need a little notice if you want to try and work them in today. I'd need a little bit of notice to get them uh, on the on the YouTube. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, we'll get to that uh, probably around lunchtime. We'll have a better idea of what our afternoon is going to be like. Uh, Mr. Hearing Examiner. Yes, uh, Richard, could you repeat those times again, please? Yes, um, 11 to 2 and after 4 today. And that's mountain time? That's mountain time. And then they would Thank be you. available all day tomorrow. Okay. Thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Hearing Center. Mm. Okay. Uh, there's nothing further. Let's uh, move on to Mr. Eisenfeld. Uh, Mr. Tisdale, do you want to present him? Hearing examiner Schoenauer. Um, it's Mary Ellen Nassi, and yes. I wanted to move my time from Patrick O'Connell, which is just 15 minutes, to Mr. Eisenfeld. So then it would be a total of 35 minutes, and I would wave cross for Mr. O'Connell. Is that okay? Yes, I'm just looking at my spreadsheet here. Yes. Which, which must look like a mess, I imagine. It does. 
Um, and, and Mr. Hing, Examiner Peter Gould again for Anna Mary. Uh, with that note from Mary, I, I'm just reminded that maybe this will help. We will waive our cross examination for Mr. O'Connell as well, if that will help. Um, so. Okay. So you had 45 minutes reserved for yes. him. Yes. Okay. We did. And we'll waive that if that will help streamline the schedule. Well, it's up to you. I mean, no, no, we're 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 uh, we're okay with with doing that. We've had a lot of conversations with my boss, so, and she told me that she doesn't want me to spend more time on the screen than I need to. Right. Okay. Well, let's let's go, Mr. Tisdale. Go ahead. Yes, um, community groups. Uh, Hang on, sorry, my, my video is having issues. Sorry, Mr. Hearing Examiner. Um, can you hear me all right? Hear you, yes. Okay, so um, I will just proceed with my video having, uh, having issues here. Um, Community groups call uh, witness Michael Eisenfeld. Mr. Lee, will you swear him in? Mr. Eisenfeld, would you raise your right hand, please? You saw him, we swear the testimony you're about to give in the matter now, and he should be the truth, whole truth, nothing but the truth. I do. <clears throat> um, Thank you. Uh, Mr. Eisenfeld, can you please state your name and uh, state and spell your name for the record, please? Michael Eisenfeld, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-E-I-S-E-N-F-E-L-D. And uh, whom are you employed with? I work for San Juan Citizens Alliance. And what position do you hold with them? I am the Energy and Climate Program Manager. And on whose behalf are you testifying today? I'm testifying on behalf of San Juan Citizens Alliance, Neva, Dene Care, and To Nijoni Ani. Do you have before you what is identified as Community Exhibit 2? Yes, I do. And this is your direct testimony dated April 2nd, 2021, is that correct? Yes. And this testimony was prepared uh, by you or at your discretion? Yes. Are there any changes or corrections to this testimony? No. And if you were asked the same questions today, would your answers be the same? Yes. And these answers are true and correct to the best of your knowledge? Yes. And there were several exhibits that were attached to your direct testimony, is that correct? Yes. Do you have what is marked as community exhibit three before you? Yes. And what is that document? It is a notice of filing direct testimony of David Schlissel on behalf of San Juan Citizens Alliance, Tony Joni Ani and Dene Care before the Arizona Corporate Commission, Docket number E 01345A 19 0236. And is that a true and correct copy of that testimony to the best of your knowledge? Yes. Um, you have before you uh, what is marked as community exhibit number four? Yes. And what is that document? That is the supplemental testimony of Thomas G. Falgren, dated March 15, 2021, in case number 21-0017-UT before the New Mexico Public Regulation Commission. And is that a true and correct copy of that testimony to the best of your knowledge? Yes. And do you have what is marked as Community Exhibit 5 before you? Yes. And what is that document? That is the Burns and McDonald San Juan Generating Station Retirement Scope and Cost Estimate prepared on behalf of Public Service Company of New Mexico. It's the PNM 
San Juan Generating Station decommissioning study uh, that was prepared uh, June 7th, 2019. And is that a true and correct copy to the best of your knowledge? Yes. <clears throat> and you have before you what is marked as community exhibit number six. Yes, I do. And what is that document? That is a capital um, LRF document prepared um, about costs at Four Corners Power Plant uh, in 2020. And where did that table come from? I believe that it came from um, one of the uh, documents from PNM about um, capital cost of um, at Four Corners Power Plant. And is that a true and correct copy of that table to the best of your knowledge? Yes. And do you have before you what is marked as community exhibit number seven? <clears throat> yes, I do. And what is that document? This is Public Service Company of New Mexico's amended application for approval of the abandonment through the sale of Four Corners Power Plant, an issue of a financing order pursuant to the Energy Transition Act. This is uh, case number 21-0017-UT. Um, and is that a true and correct copy of um, that filing to the best of your knowledge? Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Hearing Examiner, I move community exhibits two, three, four, five, six, and seven uh, to be admitted into the record. Is there any objection? Hearing no objection. No objection. No. Mr. Hearing Examiner, this is Rick Alvedris. I'm sorry, are you able to hear me? Yes. Uh, I, I do have uh, some objections. Um, to, to these, a couple of the exhibits. Uh, one is Community Exhibit 5. This is uh, the Burns and McDonald uh, San Juan Generating Station Retirement Scope. Um, you know, I object on relevance grounds. San Juan is uh, not, not an issue in this case uh, in any respect, and so it has, has no bearing on the issues in this case. Uh, likewise, um, with regard to Community Exhibit 6, uh, the witness not definitively state where he got this, um, and I'm not able to verify uh, sitting here today exactly where where this may have come from. So I don't think that there has been a proper foundation laid for uh, Exhibit 6, and so I object to uh, to 5 and 6. Mr. Tisdale? Well, yes, Mr. Hearing Examiner. Uh, with respect to Community Exhibit 5, that's the Burns and McDonald report, um, I would say that um, that decommissioning is very much a part of this case. It's uh, paragraph 56 of uh, the amended stipulation uh, deals explicitly with San Juan decommissioning and um, therefore uh, the Burns and McDonald report is, is squarely relevant on those grounds. What about number six? Um, number six, um, I am happy to, I, I don't have at my disposal right this moment um, the, where that table came from. I'm happy to, um, to look that information up and, um, and provide that to, to you to make a ruling on that, uh, on that exhibit. Well, I'm going to uh, admit uh, all of these exhibits. So. Community Exhibit 2, Community Exhibit 3, Community Exhibit 4, Community Exhibit 5, Community Exhibit 6, and Community Exhibit 7. Objections to this pre-filed testimony were due on July 30th, and none were filed. So uh, I'm going to be admitting all of those exhibits. And they are admitted. Thank you, Mr. Hearing Examiner. Um, if there's no other issues, uh, I would tender the witness to Ms. Nanasi. Okay, um, Ms. Nanasi, 
you have you're the only person who's uh, asked for a cross examination time, and you've reserved uh, 35 minutes. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Good morning, Mr. Eisenfeld. Uh, good morning, Ms. Sanasi. Um, could you tell me where you live? <clears throat> <clears throat> yes, I live in Farmington, New Mexico. How long have you lived there? 26 years. And how long have you been um, working as, um, tell me what the exact title of, of your employment is, climate? Yeah. Yes, so I work for the San Juan Citizens Alliance. I'm the energy and climate program manager, and I have worked for San Juan Citizens Alliance for 15 years. And if you could say briefly, what, um, what has been your main focus um, as the energy and and, cl and um, climate program director. Um, a just and equitable transition for Four Corners communities when um, confronted with a retirement of our coal facilities. And um, what are the main coal facilities that you have focused on in your um, in your professional career? Uh, the proposed Desert Rock coal-fired power plant, uh, San Juan Generating Station, San Juan Mine. Sorry, sir, can you start that again, the proposed? Desert Rock <clears throat> coal-fired power plant, the San Juan Generating Station and San Juan Mine, the Four Corners <laughs> Power Plant, and Navajo Mine, and <clears throat> the Navajo Generating Station, Black Mesa Cayenta. Mine. Whack. Um, Whack. Black Mesa. <clears throat> Go ahead, Mr. Um, in your uh, direct testimony, which I believe is community groups uh, exhibit number two, you talk about um, that Avangrid, if, if this merger is successful, will inherit responsibilities and liabilities for the San Juan Generating Station and the San Juan Mine. Is that right? Yes. Could you explain what you mean by that? Yes, yeah, so <clears throat> the San Juan Generating Station um, has been in existence since 1972. And the San Juan Mine, which is a mine mouth uh, coal facility is located adjacent to the power plant. And <clears throat> over, the past nearly 50 years in conjunction with the Four Corners Power Plant and Navajo Mine across the river, the San Juan River. Uh, in 2014, um, Los Alamos and the Department of Energy referred to the San Juan Generating Station and Four Corners Power Plant as the largest point source of pollution in the United States. So when these coal plants or coal complexes are retired. It raises significant concerns on assigned responsibilities, ownership, and liabilities at both of these coal complexes. And if Avangrid is going to inherit PNM's um, legacy of partial ownership of these coal facilities, it's very much a consideration in the merger case. Um, before we get into four corners, so I'd like to take these one at a time, if you if you will. So um, regarding San Juan, you understand, do you not, that PNM is an owner, but is also the operator. Is that correct? Yes. But that's not true about four corners. Yes. And in four corners, is it your understanding that APS? is the owner operator um, and, and PNM is a 13% um, share owner of four yes. corners. Sir, I just wanna say one thing. Um, it's important for the record that even though in normal conversation, if you said yes, while I was still finishing my question, that would be fine. For the record, you need to wait till I'm finished and then answer, okay? Yes. Thank you so much. Um, okay. So could, could you um, explain
what's your position regarding um, San Juan generating station cleanup, specifically decommissioning and remediation? Our position on the decommissioning of San Juan generating station is that retirement in place is not sufficient. That just transition requires full decommissioning, demolishment, uh, utility responsibilities, site reclamation. We um, believe that um, the stipulations that number 56 um, is an important uh, part of continued discussion about what is required for decommissioning uh, of San Juan Generating Station. And um, you testified um, in the San Juan abandonment case, did you not? Yes. And you opposed p and you could call it a plan um, to retire in place and essentially leave the decommissioning leave the plant the way it is for 25 years and then allegedly clean it up. Yes. And why did you oppose that then? And do you, do you have the same position now? I opposed it on the grounds that retirement in place or leaving um, the facility standing um, without proper reclamation is unacceptable for our community as we try to move forward and transition to more sustainable energy development. And I still believe that um, retirement in place, if being discussed as part of the merger case, is insufficient. Would you say that the retirement in place decommissioning plan is an intergenerational shift? Can you clarify your question, please? Um, well, so if, what I mean by intergenerational shift, and I think it's been used before, is that the, if someone were born today um, and in 25 years, there were costs associated with the decommissioning, the person who was 25 years old would not have even gotten the electricity from San Juan Generating Station. And now then, then in 25 years hence, would assume all the costs for it. it do you understand the question and what I mean by intergenerational shift? Yes. So do you believe that um, failure to clean it up promptly would be, would constitute an intergenerational shift? Yes. And can you explain why you believe cleanup is of San Juan for your community, the San Juan Generating Station, is a necessity, not only because of cost? Yes, um, there's a myriad of health, environmental, cultural, and economic impacts that have occurred over the past 50 years at San Juan Generating Station and San Juan Mine. It's a vast um, mine that went from being un from above ground to underground um, that um, PNM has uh, in the past had ownership of the mine as well as San Juan Generating Station. 50 years of uh, burning coal at San Juan Generating Station with commensurate impacts associated with water of the San Juan River. Um, there's coal combustion waste that's been dumped in um, uh, surface and uh, below ground uh, pits. Um, the mine um, has a bunch of reclamation that needs to be done. Um, I believe that the liabilities um, are, are, are extensive and um, that decommissioning and reclamation is a responsibility of PNM and the other owners at, at San Juan Generating Station. And as um, discussion kind of continues about um, the San Juan Generating Station 
that a very important um, topic will be the responsibility and liabilities and the decommissioning and demolish, demolishing of that facility is in the public interest as I see it for Northwestern New Mexico. Do you believe- Mr. Hearing Examiner, uh, Rick Alvedris, I, I object. This line of questioning is, is friendly cross. It is absolutely um, in no way uh, adverse to anything that uh, NE is advocating in this case. It's in fact, uh, completely consistent with what NE is advocating. So I think this is improper in accordance with your order. Ms. Nanazi? I believe this goes directly to his direct testimony and that's just been admitted. And um, as you have already stated, this is, um, this has been a, an admitted testimony. I believe I can go into it. This is exactly on point for, to his direct testimony. Well, at this point, it is friendly cross. Uh, at some point, I'm expecting you to make it unfriendly and actually turn it into cross. So uh, uh, we'll see how, how it goes going forward. Um, do you believe that PNM's Four Corners divestiture plan is in the public interest? <clears throat> I believe that uh, Four Corners abandonment is a separate case before the PRC and that um, there are implications in the merger case, but that um, the Four Corners power plant abandonment will go into more detail about um, the specifics. In your testimony, you state that Four Corners divestiture is a requirement of the merger. Is that your belief? Your Honor, this is Friendly Cross. It aligns uh, exactly with uh, any position. Mr. Nazi, are you going to uh, ask me about his position in regard to the stipulation, or are you just going to go through his uh, direct testimony? And have well, and on that. I do. Sorry, want Judge, I missed you broke up on that last statement. Yeah, I, I asked if she's uh, just going to go through his direct testimony and have him expand on that, or is she going to have him compare his direct testimony to the stipulation? I will do that. I think I need to set a proper foundation around um, the whole Four Corners divestiture. Okay, well, please set your foundation quickly. Does that mean that you overruled that question? I overruled that question. Do you believe that Four Corners divestiture is a requirement of the merger? Yes. Do you believe p &M's argument that the sale of Entech is positive for the Navajo Nation? No, we have significant concerns um, that will be addressed in the Four Corners Power Plant abandonment case. Um, and we have significant concerns about Entech. Your Honor, again, this is all friendly cross. Well, I, there is nothing that Ms. Nanassi is challenging this witness on. Okay, well, I, I understand this is a foundation for the <coughs> several questions. So let's get to the next several questions, Ms. Nanassi. Do you believe that the merger agreement is fair, just, and reasonable and in the public interest? Yes. And are you saying that the stipulation is or the merger agreement is? I'm making a distinction there, sir. <clears throat> the stipulation agreement. And so is it your testimony? So let me ask you this, is the merger agreement fair, just and reasonable and in the public interest? Uh, objection asked and answered. Overruled. 
Yes. Is that when you, he... Mr. Tisdell? It was Mr. Lee, I apologize. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Nassie. When you wrote your testimony, your direct testimony, was it in response to the merger agreement and the application in this case? Yes. And in that testimony, um, would it be fair to say that you opposed the merger? <clears throat> yes. What in the stipulation outweighs the concerns you have for the merger? The stipulations is currently written uh, include an increase from zero to $12.5 million in just transition funding for um, local uh, groups impacted by coal plant abandonment to determine you know, where that's gonna go. Um, development of at least a 200 megawatt renewable energy and storage facility on the Navajo Nation. Um, $7.5 million in economic development projects in New Mexico um, that excludes use for fossil fuel projects and more aggressive decarbonization. I'm sorry, projects in New Mexico that... And Mr. Eisenfeld, slow down a little. Uh, okay. Court reporter needs to be able to take down what you're saying. I apologize. $7.5 million in economic development projects in New Mexico within three years that excludes use for fossil fuel projects and more aggressive decarbonization commitments, advancing the target from 2040 to 2035. <clears throat> we're, um, we're not PNM ratepayers, so our issues are concerned primarily with transition for our community. And let me ask you this. Um, you wrote about, um, you're familiar with, you're familiar with Avangrid and PNM's ESG goals, correct? Yes. Do you think it's hypocritical of Avangrid to require the sale of um, sale by PNM to Entech, so it's no longer on its books, and it can meet its ESG goals, but that the sale to Entech will continue coal burning. Objection, Brian Haverly misstates the record. Their Avangrid has not required the sale uh, to Entech. Overruled. Our organization has intervened in the Four Corners Power Plant abandonment case, and we definitely um, believe that that would be front and center uh, in that case. In terms of the uh, in terms of the merger case, um, we believe that the stipulations um, move us in the right direction uh, for. Um, the situation that we're in with the coal facilities here in the Four Corners area. Even though it requires the divestiture, as you've already testified, and the sale to Entech, which will keep coal burning. We object um, to the uh, to the Entech component of any agreement. Um, PNM claims that 
Entech, the Entech deal is the only way out of Four Corners. Do you believe that that's accurate? No. Why not? The rapidly shifting economics of coal have now given us more of an opinion that <clears throat> retirement of Four Corners Power Plant will be way sooner than 2031 and maybe in the 2025 to 2027 area. Um, recent developments um, in Arizona suggest that um, the majority owner there, Arizona Public Service Company, may not be able to recover the money they put into pollution controls at the Four Corners Power Plant. And then um, one of the exhibits that I have shows that there are a lot of costs that will be incurred to continue operations at the Four Corners Power Plant uh, in the area of $600 million. Has Avangrid committed to work on the early shutdown of Four Corners Power Plant? I don't know. Has Avangrid committed to you um, that it will cover any decommissioning or other liabilities, environmental liabilities associated with the Four Corners power plant if Entech is unable to meet those responsibilities? No. And sir, when I say you, I mean you and the other community groups, is, is that a clear? Would your answer be the same? if I made that um, explanation? Yes, my answer would be the same. Has Avangrid committed to you and the other community groups that it will address decommissioning and the demolition of San Juan Generating Station um, as part of this deal. Mr. Hearingsheimer, Brian Haverly, I object to this line of questioning. It's seeking information regarding settlement discussions, which are not admissible in a commission proceeding under 1.2.2.20C. Nazi. Well, there have been times when we've seen in this hearing that all of a sudden one um, party or another has agreed in live testimony to um, to to with Avangrid about certain changes to the stipulation that we didn't know about. And I believe this is a fair question given both Mr. Eisenfeld's um, initial testimony and um, the alleged commitments that Avangrid has made to the environment. Well, I'm not sure what your question is. Are you asking him about settlement discussions? No, I'm just asking him has Avangrid made a commitment to responsibly clean up San Juan Generating Station to him or the other community groups. Okay, well, we'll leave out the issue of settlement discussions, but uh, answer the question of 
with that limitation in mind, uh, Mr. Eisenfeld? Yes, um, in the joint applicant uh, exhibit number two, um, June 4th, 2021, the San Juan decommissioning, <clears throat> that um, item number 56, the, that we uh, are going to hold PNM and have in grid accountable to use good faith efforts um, to work with the other owners and former San Juan Generating Station owners who have an obligation to participate in decommissioning and that um, decommissioning demolition and site restoration of the site are what we want and that you asked about a transgenerational issue and that um, is definitely part of our considerations. So we believe that um, this has been accounted for um, acceptably to this point. And sir, um, do you have that um, stipulation and paragraphs 56 before you? Yes. Um, is there any penalty for P, uh, uh, against either PNM or Avangrid or both if they fail to engage in good faith efforts? <clears throat> the, uh, <clears throat> the participation in decommissioning uh, has other elements. Um, including the fact that part of this uh, facility has federal permits. So there's bonds and there's accountability for, um, for decommissioning that all owners and former owners and any entity that comes in um, are gonna be responsible for. And I think the main question now is that if there's any further consideration of retirement in place, that that's completely unacceptable for this facility and that there needs to be further discussion with former San Juan Generating Station owners about what it is that they want to do and what PNM wants to do. Uh, PNM is not off the hook if they merge with another company or sell to another company. There are historic liabilities associated with the facility that have state and federal permitting obligations. Bonds, reclamation, um, it's only what any community should expect when a facility is retired. And those bonds, where are those held? <clears throat> I believe that there are bonds held with the state of New Mexico and with the federal government under the auspices of the Department of the Interior. And so those holding PNM accountable or possibly Avangrid accountable um, relative to those bonding issues um, is not under the authority of the PRC, is it? I do not believe that it is under the authority of the PRC, but I do believe that it is a consideration for any merger and or discussion concerning decommissioning. Um, but you already, you as, as, a, as a member and representative of the community, you already have that right um, to try and get those bonds um, to be released so that you can require cleanup um, from those other entities, specifically the state of New Mexico, correct? Yes, um, and I believe that those kick in uh, when, when and if retirement occurs. So, what I wanted to ask you about um, paragraph 56 is there's no penalty provision 
if p and fails to make a good faith effort to work with um, owners and former owners, correct? You have five minutes, Ms. Sinan. I believe that is correct. And this requirement <clears throat> actually in, in if, it's, if it is a requirement in paragraph 56 does not say that there has to be community consultation, does it? <clears throat> community community uh, participation will be inherent um, in our continued um, work within this merger case and um, the uh, Energy Transition Act implementation of San Juan Generating Station and the abandonment of Four Corners Power Plant. I believe that that's a central term um, of our intervening in these cases. But I'm asking you not about the ETA, which um, does or does not um, require certain community um, input. Uh, I'm asking you specifically about the rights that the community has under paragraph 56. Um, is there anything that's mentioned about the community in paragraph 56? I don't believe that it mentions uh, the community, but again, I believe that with um, the current owners and the former owners that some of their interests will transcend um, some of the same um, issues that community, um, the community would uh, bring up. Um, you have as one of your exhibits, the Burns and McDonald study. Um, and that was done in 2019, is that correct? Um, yes, that's correct. Let me just pull it up. Is that Burns, B-U-R-N-S, and McDonald, M-C, D-O-N-A-L-D? No, the McDonald is M, little c, capital D, O-N-N-E-L-L. -L. Thank you. And in 2019, um, do you know that this document, the San Juan Generating Station Retirement Scope and Cost Estimate was um, provided to the other um, co-owners of San Juan? I believe that it was. And in the San Juan abandonment case, this was a document that was entered into evidence. Is that correct? I, I believe that it was. And the former owners and community groups at that time in that case took the position that, um, that the retirement in place um, decommissioning plan of PNMs was unacceptable. Is that right? That's correct. So what do you believe in paragraph 56 is going to make PNM or Avangrid take a different path? I believe that there's a commitment from Avangrid to recognize the, the liabilities associated with the coal facilities in the Four Corners region are not in their best interest. And that when you look at the Burns and McDonald report and it talks about projected costs for full demolition of San Juan Generating Station estimated at $118 million, that that's uh, reasonable. And that um, that's the sort of thing that we um, are expecting Avangrid or any other utility that comes into our community 
to uh, comply with. Is there anything in the stipulation that requires what you just said? <clears throat> I believe the key words are good faith. Um, we have been um, in, this, in our move towards the stipulations that are in this merger case, um, there's going to be a certain um, <clears throat> component of the community having to develop relationships um, with departing utilities and incoming utilities where further um, discussions will be needed. And uh, we believe that um, the retirement in place is completely unacceptable. And um, the sooner that we retire the coal plants here and move to more sustainable and renewable um, energy sources, the better. Your time's up, Mr. Eisen. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Eisenfeld. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Tisdall, is there any redirect? Yeah, just a few questions, Your Honor. Um, Mr. Eisenfeld, you stated uh, earlier um, that your testimony was filed prior to uh, the stipulation in this case, correct? Correct. And um, Ms. Nanasi asked you several times about the relationship of the merger case and the Four Corners abandonment case, um, which is also before the PRC right now. Um, and it's your testimony that the Four Corners case is uh, separate from this merger? Yes. Um, and are you aware that there's been testimony filed um, in, in the merger case, which uh, uh, we are currently dealing with right now, um, are you aware of testimony that has been filed that states that, that regardless of the outcome of Four Corners abandonment, um, that it is Avangrid's intention to move forward with the merger? Yes. Um, would you turn um, to uh, exhibit what's been identified as JA2? Uh, that is the second amended stipulation. Yes. And Ms. Nanasi was asking you a lot of questions about decommissioning um, and the obligations and, and commitments uh, made in paragraph 56. Uh, do you recall that? Yes. And if you would turn um, to uh, using the pagination at the top of that exhibit, so it's um, at page 14 uh, of 45, at the very bottom of that and then continuing on to page 15. Um, and this is uh, under, uh, it, the pagination is a little bit different, but it's under paragraph two, which is the economic development commitments made. And then there's several bullet points, um, but at the bottom of page 14 and going on to page 15, um, would you read into the record um, the, the sentence that starts with the joint applicants commit? Do you see what I'm talking about there? Yes. Uh, so would you read that into the record for me, please? The joint applicants commit to engage in periodic meetings at least twice annually with impacted community stakeholders in the Four Corners region and the Office of the Attorney General for the state of New Mexico to discuss community interests regarding joint applicants, operations and renewable energy and storage development in the Four Corners region. And uh, this provision was something that, um, that, that you and the other community groups negotiated for in the stipulation, is that correct? Yes. 
Um, and what was um, the reason for, uh, for negotiating that this provision be included? The reason for this is that um, our groups are typically not um, invited to the dialogue um, concerning transition and that our community is often reluctant to address the closure of coal-fired power plants with the idea that um, things are going to continue as usual. And one of the main things that we're concerned about is, is the transition. And so we wanted to ensure that there were vehicles for us to have um, direct communication with um, the joint applicants and that um, Avangrid, if the merger is successful, needs to you know, ensure that um, they have communication with us. Um, and we're not the only community group, obviously, in um, community groups in Northwest New Mexico, but um, we are, um, I believe, uh, stakeholders in a process that holds a lot of weight. And, um, and this provision and this commitment for ongoing discourse and dialogue with impacted community groups and stakeholders, um, that was something that, that the joint applicants uh, readily agreed to, is that correct? Objection, Your Honor. I believe that Mr. Um, Tisdale's question um, is, is not what this uh, stipulation says, ongoing commitments to dialogue, et cetera. That's not what this um, stipulation states. Overruled. Can I answer the question, Mr. Eisenfeld? Can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, simply that um, that this commitment for ongoing dialogue uh, with impacted communities and stakeholders in the Four Corners region, um, that this was a commitment that was readily agreed to by the joint applicants. Yes. And is it your intention that, um, that uh, the decommissioning issues at San Juan Generating Station, um, that, that those issues will be a part of that ongoing dialogue? Yes. Um, thank you, Mr. Eisenfeld. Um, nothing further. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hearing Examiner. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Eisenfeld. Uh, thank you for your testimony, you're excused. Thank you. Okay, uh, next we move to Walmart and, uh, and Walmart's witness, uh, Mr. Bartel. Yes, uh, Randy Bartel on behalf of Walmart. This time uh, we are calling Steve Chris. I believe he's on the uh, screen somewhere. There he is. Good morning. Good morning. Mr. Chris. Um, I need to have... swear the witness. Would you please raise your right hand? You saw me swear the testimony you're about to give the matter up and you speak the truth, all truth, nothing but the truth. Thank you. Mr. Chris, do you have available to you what's been labeled WM1, Walmart 1, direct testimony and exhibits of Steve W. Chris on behalf of Walmart Inc.? Yes. Did you prepare this testimony? Yes. Are there any corrections that you need to make to it? Do you adopt this testimony as your sworn testimony in this case? Yes. I move the admission of WM1, Walmart 1. Is there any objection? Uh, WM1, 
one is admitted. And, and Mr. Chris, you need to speak a little bit more loudly. Uh, it's, it's difficult to hear you. Um, but go, go ahead, uh, Mr. Bartel. And uh, Mr. Chris, do you have available to you what is MNORC WM2, Walmart 2, settlement testimony of Steve W. Chris on behalf of Walmart Inc.? Yes. Did you prepare this testimony? Yes. Are there any corrections that you need to make to it? No. Do you adopt this testimony as your sworn testimony in this proceeding? Yes. I move the admission of WM2, Walmart 2. Any objection? Okay, uh, WM2 is admitted. And I will pass the witness. Okay, uh, we have one party uh, wanting to cross Mr. Chris. That's uh, Mr. Albright. You reserve seven minutes. Uh, yes, Mr. Hearing Examiner. Now, good morning, Mr. Chris. Good morning. Good to see you again. It's, it's sort of like a welcoming uh, back to Santa Fe, but not quite. <clears throat> Um, I'm Jeff Albright, representing J. Albright Law, LLC, and I'm here on behalf of Bernalillo County today. Uh, I do have a few questions for you, so if you would please turn to um, your direct testimony uh, at page five, that would be helpful. See, I'm there. Testimony or April or June 18? I'm sorry, the, the, uh, the direct testimony that would be of uh, let me get the date here. That would be the April 2nd testimony. Okay, thank you. Excuse me. Thank you. And at, uh, at line, lines 14 through 18, um, you recommend that the commission should within 60 days of the close of the transaction convene a stakeholder process for the development of one or more renewable energy offerings for each customer type. And then you have a short list there. Have I correctly uh, represented that or restated that? That's correct. Can you explain, uh, can you explain how that would work or what you have in mind with re respect to renewable energy offerings for each of those different classes there, residential, small commercial, large commercial, industrial, to be proposed. What, what do you have in mind there? It wasn't clear to me. So um, the big driver you know, from Walmart's perspective um, is looking at another tranche of the solar direct program. Uh, that the commission approved it actually that may have even been in 2020 it's been a little while now um, so that that's sort of the, the avenue for us that we see as part of it but ultimately you know through that process it sounds like there are a number of different customers who, uh, across all the customer classes who are interested in renewable programs um, and certainly good for the utility to uh, begin having discussions with representatives of each of the customer classes to determine what sort of programs and program structures would work best for um, each of their constituents. And why include that as part of the stipulation as a condition for the transaction uh, approval? Why not via a separate petition? Well, ultimately, um, it's part of, you know, I, I'll, let me take a step back. You know, as utilities look at mergers and you know, looking at changing you know, the structure of their operations, there are a number of different things that are important to different parties. Um, you know, and the the stipulation reflects a lot of those. For us, um, given our renewable and carbon goals that we have, uh, renewable energy programs, particularly with our with the utilities from which we take service, um, are an important part of what we look to get out of the utility relationship and help develop within the utility relationship, you know, because those programs aren't just for you know, Walmart, the programs impact uh, lots of different customers. Solar Direct has a number of different entities that are participating in it. And so we see the merger process as 
one way to reinforce the fact that that is part of what we are looking for in our utility relationships and creating those channels to ensure that those conversations happen. Um, you know, a lot of, in my experience, a lot of the utility renewable programs that have been developed have happened through um, informal discussions as opposed to somebody filing a petition and saying, you know, utility X, thou shalt, um, you know, create this program. Because ultimately, there's a lot of give and take that goes into it, a lot of understanding of the customer's business. I'm sorry. Um, that Can you is, restate that? Sorry. After um, thou shalt do this program. I, well, I'll, I'll, I'll start with that. Typically, these programs are the product of more informal discussions prior to regulatory filings. And so it's important for us that the utility be committed to having those discussions. Uh, for Avangrid, historically in the U.S., they are not a generation-owning or generation-serving utility. So this will be a new part of that business for them in the U.S. And so we want to ensure that those um, conversations happen. And so that is reflected in um, Section 51 of the stipulation uh, with the joint applicants committing to uh, work with stakeholders around Solar Direct. And Mr. Chris, you'll recall that um, you'll recall that Bernalillo County was one of the participants in the Solar Direct program, correct? Um, that's my recollection. And that Walmart was was the only commercial entity involved in the solar direct uh, proceeding with regard to being a recipient of the production, correct? That's, that's correct. So do you envision by incorporating this provision as part of the stipulation that Walmart would be carving out a larger percentage or additional percentage of some kind of uh, renewable energy from another solar direct type program? Um. So for us, we'd look to participate in an additional program. Uh, the current Solar Direct program um, will provide renewable energy equivalent to just less than half of our usage under PNM, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, so there's, there's, we've got some more space to go uh, that we'd love to be able to do with the utility, but also want to be sure that any program that's developed has broader applicability and is available to other uh, customers as well. So we're not looking for something specific to Walmart. And with respect to Walmart, um, do you get do you get billed uh, as a customer for each individual store that you have, or is it aggregated for one with regard to all of your I forget how many thirty some stores that you have in New Mexico? Uh, how does that work for Walmart? So each store um, has its own account and billing when, and may actually have more than one account depending on how many meters are at the facility. Okay, so with regard to, with regard to things like the rate credit, uh, which is another issue that's been raised here in, in the testimony uh, and your testimony as well. Um, if, if that's distributed on a per customer basis, would each of your stores count as an individual customer? That would be my understanding if it is calculated similar to how a basic service charge uh, would be calculated. And so whether it is 26 million in rate relief or 50 million or 75 million or whatever the rate relief number ends up to be, um, your particular share, when I say your, Walmart's particular share would, would uh, a large portion, or, or at least a substantial, I won't say large, but uh, would be allocated toward Walmart. Uh, Walmart would get that relief as an individual customer if it were done on, on a customer basis, correct? So, the way you ask the question makes it, it would sort of suggest that we're somehow re-aggregated. And ultimately, if, if the allocation were done on a per customer basis, that would mean that for 
each customer class, the number of customers it, or the, the revenue requirement for that class would be divided by the number of customers creating you know, some sort of dollar per customer month rate. Um, each account that we have that would be, would be credited you know, whatever that amount would look like. So, um, but I think the answer to your question is yes, but um, just want to make sure that, you know, that the, the framework is that um, we have, you know, numerous accounts, you know, within p ms territory. Um, right. It's not just Walmart is one customer. Let me ask one final question. Uh, under the rate, with the rate credits, if they are distributed, does Walmart get better savings if you do it based on a per customer basis, or do you get, would get more of the credits if you did it on a kilowatt usage basis in New Mexico? So when you say kilowatt usage, do you mean by kilowatt hour? Yes, kilowatt hour, kilowatt I'm sorry. Demand? Kilo, no, okay. kilowatt hour. So I, I have not performed that analysis. Um, typically in my experience, when you know, mergers have rate credits associated with them, they're typically done on a kilowatt hour basis. I think that the general um, overarching premise is that um, the kilowatt hour usage is most reflective of revenues paid into the utility. And so they roll credits back relative to that. Um, it's certainly not a, a perfect uh, comparator just because different classes have different rates, et cetera. Um, but that's ultimately when, when, when utilities look for the easiest way to charge or credit something, they typically land on the kilowatt hour charge. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's tougher with a, with a rate credit because there's not necessarily a cost of service basis from which to work. Um, so you can, you know, pick and choose different ways to do it. Um, but, you know, as an example over on the Texas side in, in the merger case there. Not, uh, not interested in the Texas that. side. And I didn't ask the question about Texas. Um, um, one final question uh, for you related to the proposal that uh, Ms. Reno uh, has proposed for Burnleyo County. Have you looked at her testimony by any chance? Um, I, I've reviewed it, but if you can point to a specific area and then I also need to. Okay, let me just it. ask the question then. Do, would Walmart have any objection with regard to additional rate credits or with regard to additional economic development for Burnleyo County? Uh, Greater uh, Albuquerque, Bernalillo County metropolitan area, or other areas within PM service area, or in addition to the um, rate relief via the arrearages that are being posed, would Walmart have any opposition if those were uh, included as part of the uh, uh, whatever revised stipulation uh, comes forth out of the hearings? Um, you know, without seeing a specific proposal. Um, I, there's certainly, I can't commit us, but ultimately to the extent that rate credits are increased or there's uh, additional uh, things done for Bernalillo County or others, I mean, we're not, we're not going to stand in the way of that. Um, what about a rate we freeze? To at this point. I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Albright, um, your, time, your time's up. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chris. I appreciate uh, your testimony and your uh, response today. Thank you, Mr. Hearing Examiner. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Bartell, do you have any redirect? No redirect. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Chris. Thank you for your testimony. You're excused. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're moving on to uh, the Sierra Club's witness, uh, Mr. Fisher. Um, I don't think he's been admitted, has he? Uh, he should. Can you check your waiting room, Mr. Van Examiner, please? Yeah, I am. I don't see him. Right. And uh, I just mentioned for uh, Western Resource Advocates, I admitted Mr. Michael 
and uh, we're allowing one attorney per party on these uh, calls. So if Mr. Michael is going to uh, participate in the cross-examination here, Ms. Beatles needs to remove herself. Yes, of course, I plan to do that. I didn't know he was already in. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, here's Mr. Fisher. Should be apparent. Okay. Uh, Marks. I don't, I, don't see Mr. Mr. I don't see Mr. Fisher. Uh, I'm here. Mr. Fisher, would you raise your right hand, please? You sound like for the testimony you're about to give you the matter up and you should be the truth, whole truth, nothing but the truth. Yes, I do. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Fisher, do you have uh, with you an exhibit marked SC-1? I do. And can you identify that? Uh, SC-1 is my direct testimony on behalf of Sierra Club with respect to the amended stipulation uh, uh, filed June 18th. Mr. Fisher, can I ask you to take a look at it again for the for SC-1? Oh, I'm, I'm so I apologize. Um, SC-1 is my direct testimony um, on the merger agreement dated April 2nd, 2021. Thank you. Thank you. And was that prepared by you or under your direction? Uh, yes, it was. Uh, are the answers therein true and accurate to the best of your knowledge? Yes, they are. And if I asked you the same questions today, uh, would your answers be the same? I would. They would. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Grand Examiner, I move admission of Exhibit SC-1, which is Mr. Fisher's testimony filed on April 2nd, 2021. Is there any objection? Hearing none, uh, SC-1 is admitted. And now, Mr. Fisher, can I direct you to the document mark SD-2? I'm there. Okay, and is that the one you referenced earlier, your uh, testimony concerning the stipulation filed it on is. June 18th? Yes, it is. Uh, was that prepared by you or under your direction? Yes, it was. Uh, are the answers there in true and accurate to the best of your knowledge? They are, yes. If I asked you the same questions today, would your answers be the same? They would. Uh, Mr. Hearing Examiner, I would move admission of exhibit SC-2. Is there any objection? Hearing none. Um... SC exhibit dash two is admitted. Thank you. Uh, I would pass the witness for cross examination. Okay, uh, on my list, uh, the uh, water authority is listed first. Uh, Mr. Harris, do you have any questions? Uh, Mr. Hearn examiner, I believe uh, the water authority waived cross examination on this witness by trading time. At any rate, we have no questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Albright, you've reserved 10 minutes. Uh, yes, Mr. Hearing Examiner. Uh, good morning, uh, Dr. Fisher. Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Jeff Albright. I'm with Jeff with J. Albright Law LLC, and I represent Bernalillo County in this proceeding. Uh, Dr. Fisher, I want to uh, focus on, uh, I have some questions concerning your June 18, 2021 testimony. I think that was your uh, exhibit exhibit two, I believe. It's labeled as direct testimony, but I believe it was filed on the June 18th. That's correct. Okay. All right. I'd like you to turn to uh, page four. I'm there. All right. And do you see the question that says, uh, do you support any of the provisions in the stipulation? Yes, sir. Okay, I'm, I'm trying to get some clarification here in that uh, you indicate support um, with regard to uh, executive compensation uh, issues. 
um, with regard to the uh, uh, incentives, uh, executive compensation incentives, uh, the lines aren't numbered, but I believe it's toward the end of that paragraph. Um, do you see that language? I do, yes. Tied to carbon reduction targets? Yes. Okay, I believe earlier in this proceeding, there was representation made that, that the incentives were going to be listed for the executives to accomplish or goals to accomplish, but the compensation was not necessarily part of it. So I'm trying to reconcile that testimony with what you have here and your understanding as to whether there is or is not executive compensation for, for those goals. So I was not present earlier during uh, hearings, so I was not privy to that particular conversation. Um, my specific uh, note here is with respect to commitment number 44 uh, in the uh, second amended stipulation uh, with respect to compensation associated with reduction, carbon reduction targets um, and specifically noting that the incentive compensation for all relevant PNM executives will include goals related to the achievement of PNM's 2040 reduction targets. Uh, and then it continues on beyond that. And that's, that's in the current, that's in the current stipulation that uh, is before the uh, commission. Uh, that was with respect to the second amended stipulation as I understood it at the time. Okay. And you aren't referring to an individual that's being hired uh, to lead the environmental uh, aspects um, after the merger, are you? There was talk of hiring a, a specific, someone specifically to address engineering. It wasn't quite clear if that was gonna be an additional hire or if it was going to be some someone from in-house that was going to, to fill that role. Do you recall that discussion? I do not recall that discussion. I was not okay. present for that discussion. All right, let's move on then. Uh, to, on the next page, on page five of 36, uh, under paragraph four at the bottom, uh, you state the merger should include a commitment that joint applicants will pledge not to contribute to emissions leakage through contractual mechanisms or corporate policies and will report to the commission on any actions that could lead to meaningful emissions leakage. Have I correctly quoted that, Dr. Fisher? You have, and I apologize for the lack of line numbering. Thank you for your patience. It, it makes it a little challenging, but certainly something we can overcome. Uh, so my question is there, how would that be done? And what are we talking about with regard to emissions leakage? Um, so let me take those in reverse order. Um, okay. With respect to emissions leakage, I'm specifically referring to uh, initiatives, corporate policies, and mechanisms that would otherwise um, allow uh, avant-grid um, or the joint applicants in this case to claim an overall lower emissions on their own behest while leading to emissions increases in other areas due to their actions, right? That would not otherwise be directly attributable to their own fleet. So in this case, the emissions leakage that's quite relevant to the merger right now is uh, merger agreement 6.19, which moves four corners out of uh, Avant Grid's uh, portfolio or PNM's portfolio, um, but continues, but pledges to continue its operation after, um, in the interim period between uh, the time that, uh, between now and the time that it is closed, um, or at least that the transaction is closed, um, and then has additional mechanisms that require it to stay open uh, past. Uh, the transfer from Public Service New Mexico to NTEC. Um, so in my accounting, I consider that a form of leakage 
where while it's no longer being accounted for by Avangrid and PNM, it's now being, uh, it's a source of emissions that's still relevant to the state of New Mexico and to the climate in general. Um, and I apologize, I was going to take your questions in reverse order and you may have to remind me of the first part of your question. Now it's my fault for asking compound question, which I'm prone to do uh, oftentimes. So no, no problem with that at all. But what do you mean by, by contractual, uh, can you give us some examples of what contractual mechanisms or corporate policies uh, would do that? It just uh, like a rather vague statement without much su substance there. Yeah, thank you. Um, so a uh, contractual mechanism um, would be any form of a release of uh, an emissions uh, source um, that, is, uh, that is either at PNM or Avant Grid's control uh, that it takes out of its portfolio for the purposes of meeting its own climate commitments and yet continues to have impacts elsewhere. And by virtue of having that contractual mechanism contributes to increases in emissions or continuation of emissions that are otherwise unnecessary. And corporate policies broadly refers to the same. In this case, Avangrid has a stated and publicized corporate policy in which it tracks its scope one and scope two emissions. So those are emissions due to its own fleet and those due to emissions uh, sources to which it is contracted but it does not have a policy with respect to emissions caused by its actions, which are scope three emissions. Um, and so that corporate policy, in my opinion, is broken. That corporate policy, policy in my opinion, is? Broken. Thank you. Mr. Albright, you have two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Hearing Examiner. Could you turn to page? Could you turn to page ten of thirty-six? I'm there. And uh, again, down at the uh, bottom, under paragraph four, you talk about the specifically merger condition six point one nine and the associated transfer of. PNM's interest in Four Corners to NTEC to NTEC may prolong the operation of Four Corners power plant. Have I quoted that directly? Uh, yes. Do you have, is there any reason to believe that it will prolong the operation of the plant or is it just speculation that it may prolong the operation of the plant, which is how you state it there? Um, through the course of my testimony, I lay out multiple lines of evidence that the plant could in fact close earlier than it would otherwise under the conditions that have been put forward in the abandonment proceeding as called for under the merger agreement section 6.19. So I believe that there is a direct causal relationship from clause 6.19 to the abandonment proceeding and the form of that abandonment proceeding, which in this case does directly preclude the retirement of that plant prior to uh, 2027 and now prior to 2029. And I believe that there is good reason, and again, I present multiple lines of evidence that, but for that specific agreement emerging from clause 6.19, the plant in fact could close economically prior to uh, the dates set forth under that abandonment proceeding. Okay, Mr. Hearing Examiner, I have no further questions for Dr. Fisher. Uh, Dr. Fisher, thank you very much for your testimony and your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, uh, before we go on to uh, WRA's cross-examination, we're going to need, we're going to take a break. Uh, and let's uh, break until uh, uh, 15 minutes uh, until uh, 1042. So we'll recess till 1042. Thank you.
How was the birthday, David? It was great, Mr. Marks. Thank you for asking. Oh. Wonderful. Yeah. Next time I'm in town, I'm stopping by Juno. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All. Be happy to buy you one for your birthday. Well, thank you. When you're ready, Judge. Okay, good. Uh, uh, next up is uh, Mr. Michael. Uh, you've uh, reserved uh, 25 minutes. Yes, thank you, Mr. Schanauer. There you are. Okay, good. Go ahead. Okay. Good morning, Dr. Fisher. Good morning. How are you? Great. Thank you. Um, so at the end of your the questioning by uh, Mr. Albright, you referred to, um, I guess, the transfer agreement, of the Four Corners plan from PM to MTech. Um, that agreement is uh, subject to approval by the, this commission in case 20 00017, right? That's right. Okay. Or my understanding, anyway. Okay. And um, so, Turning to your exhibit two, and I'm going to be entirely referring to uh, your June 18th testimony. Now, that testimony was filed um, on June 18th, right? That's correct. And the procedural order in the case um, uh, identified that date as the date to, to file testimony by parties that either support the stipulation or do not have a position on the stipulation. Is that is that right? That's my understanding. Okay. And so is it fair to interpret your testimony as while Sierra Club does not support the stipulation, they're not asking that the merger and stipulation be rejected but rather that it be improved in certain ways that you identify in your testimony. Is that a fair characterization? That's right, yes. Okay. And could you, um, could you turn to page 33 of your testimony, please? Are you there? I'm there, I am, okay. yes. And. At the bottom of your testimony, you recommend that PM's executive incentive compensation uh, be tied to achievement of the state's uh, 
carbon reduction targets as embodied in the Energy Transition Act. And you quote the act there, right? Yes, sir. Okay. And the act calls for electric utilities to basically provide zero emission energy to their customers by 2045, or in the case of co-ops, I believe it's 2050, is that right? Uh, I don't recall the provision with respect to co-ops, but okay. um, but yes, with respect to utilities, 2045. Okay, and you're aware that in the stipulation in paragraph 43, um, one of the one of the merger commitments is to achieve decarbonization um, P and M system ten years earlier by 2035, right? To, to the extent it's consistent with the public interest. Uh, can, can you point me back to uh, which commitment? Yeah, it's uh, paragraph 43 of the uh, second amended stipulation. It's on page 21. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I see this statement you're referring to. Yes. Okay. Um, and that's better than 2045, right? I mean, from an environmental standpoint. Well, it is, except it's restricted to PNM um, in this case. And the point here is actually similar to a discussion point that I had with Mr. Albright, um, which is that I believe that by focusing only on PNM alone rather than the achievement of the state, uh, PNM is prone to leakage, um, i.e., the movement of resources into the state and out of its own. Um, out of its own portfolio that do not otherwise actually help the state achieve its targets. Okay. So if you go back to your testimony, you quote the Energy Transition Act, right? And it says, achieve by 2045, zero carbon resources shall supply 100% of all- I'm sorry. I'm sorry, zero carbon resources and I missed the next word. Shall supply 100% of all retail sales of electricity in New Mexico. You see that? That's what the ETA calls for, right, Dr. Fisher? It does. And I do state that, yes. Okay. And so this also has a potential for leakage, right? Compliance with this language as you define leakage. Uh there are potentials for leakage if there are resources placed in other states, um, but less so because it is a uh, there's a sales component of it um, that ultimately it's being served to the customers of New Mexico. It's a broader target than PNM alone. Right, but a generation swap, if you will, of a clean resource for a dirty resource would improve the outcome the outcome necessarily in New Mexico, but may still comply with the language that you've identified on page 33, right? That's true, yes. Okay. And so, if you've got leakage either way, 2035 is going to be a better target date than 2045, right? Other things being equal. All else um, being equal, yes. Okay. And finally, so you say that you would like the incentive tied to compliance with the Energy Transition Act, right? Um, so what your testimony is on page 33? That's right. And so what it, so basically p &M executives would be rewarded if they obey the law or if the state obeys the law. Is that, is that what you're saying? Uh, no, well, well I, they should be rewarded if they obey the law by, uh, continuing to operate a system that operates within the bounds of the law. Um, but the point here that I'm attempting to make is that 
um, PNM's pathway towards that 2045 target should be fully consistent and in this case, uh, uh, operating to help the state meet its targets um, in a meaningful sort of way. So again, um, there's a distinction that PNM, of course, is required to meet its obligations under the Energy Transition Act. I think incrementally to that, the PNM executives should have a compensation mechanism that's tied to helping the state broader than PNM alone meet its obligations and move at a pace that's reasonable. So if PNM executives are able to convince their counterparts in the other utilities and co-ops in the state to also obey the law, PNM, they get incentives paid assuming that they successfully convince those counterparts to obey the law? Um, in this case, it was, it is a hope that PNM would go beyond just obeying the law and its counterparts also just obeying the law, but helping the state meet those targets in an expedited fashion. Okay. And the stipulation does embody that by, at least for PNM, moving that target up 10 years, right? Uh, that is a component of the stipulation, yes. Okay. That's all the questions I have, Dr. Fisher. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Michael. Uh, let's move to uh, Mr. Haverly. You've reserved 15 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Examiner. I'm going to actually uh, wave my 15 minutes. I don't have any questions for this witness. Okay. Uh, let's go to uh, probably Mr. Alvidrez. You reserved uh, 30 minutes. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. I've got a, a few questions. Uh, good morning, Dr. Fisher. I'm Rick Alvidrez. I'm one of the lawyers for Public Service Company of New Mexico and PNM Resources. And uh, as I understand it, you filed two sets of testimony in this case, correct? That's correct. And uh, I believe you testify in, in your um, in Exhibit 2 that the majority of your testimony here in June 18. 2021 concerning the stipulation is repeated verbatim from your prior direct testimony filed on April 2nd, 2021. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. So we'll focus on your June uh, 18, 21 testimony, 2021 testimony. And on page three, you uh, talk about uh, section 6.19 of the the merger agreement, and that it sets out certain conditions for closing of the proposed merger. Is that correct? I don't have a line number, so I can't direct you to the line number. Uh, I'm sorry about the line numbers again, but uh, I agree that I discuss clause 6.19. Okay, and uh, you understand that section 6.19 uh, sets out uh, conditions, two conditions, or closing of the proposed merger transaction, correct? Uh, yes. Okay, and uh, one condition is that PNM is to enter into a uh, into definitive agreements to exit Four Corners Power Plant uh, by no later than December 31, 2024, correct? I. Uh, Yes. Um, uh, yes, I, I believe the 2024 is part of the second clause, but I agree. Okay, and um, PNM has in fact entered into an agreement with NTEC, that's NTEC, uh, to sell its 13% interest uh, effective December 31, 2024, right? That's correct. And so uh, this condition has been met under the merger agreement, under section uh, 6.19, correct? Uh, yeah. And the second condition under section 6.19 is that PNM must have filed for abandonment of its interest in four quarters uh, prior to the closing of the um, proposed merger. Isn't that correct? Uh, I read it as all regulatory filings and all commercially reasonable actions to obtain those approvals. 
And would you uh, read the, the requirement with regard to regulatory requirements to include uh, the request for the abandonment and uh, sale of its interest in uh, Four Corners to NTEC? Uh, that is one mechanism by which that could be executed, yes. Okay. And PNM has, in fact, uh, filed case number uh, 210017, uh, seeking commission approval for abandonment of its interest in Four Corners and the sale uh, of its interest to NTEC. Isn't that correct? Uh, yes. And so the two conditions under uh, section 6.19 of the merger agreement have been satisfied, correct? Uh, I don't think I fully agree with that um, because I believe that it re still requires that PNM continue to take all commercially reasonable actions, um, which I believe is a continuation of the defense of that uh, abandonment proceeding uh, through its closure. Um, so, so do you go ahead? I'm sorry. Uh, so, so I would not agree that it's fully satisfied yet. Well, uh, has um, do you have any information that uh, PNM is not exercising uh, commercially reasonable efforts to uh, pursue abandonment? No. And uh, we also know that uh, final approval of uh, PNM's abandonment of its interest in uh, Four Corners is not a condition. I'm sorry, Mr. I'm sorry, Mr. Avi just broke up. Can you start your question again? Yes. And we also know that final approval of the abandonment of PNM's interest in Four Corners is not a condition of closing under the merger agreement. Isn't that correct? Uh, I believe that is correct. Um, although um, the, uh, I apologize. Uh, the element of the uh, stipulation uh, with respect to that, I'm sorry. Please hold for a second. Um, my understanding is that uh, parties have stipulated in this case that uh, a non-decision or dismissal of the case uh, would not affect the outcome of the merger. Um, but uh, beyond that, um, I don't have a legal opinion as to uh, whether um, the case otherwise being resolved unsatisfactorily uh, would uh, satisfy conditions of 6.19. Not an attorney. But you're aware that, I'm sorry. Not you're an aware that. Uh... I, I'm not asking for a legal opinion either. Uh, although I do notice you give uh, quite a bit of interpretation in your testimony about uh, statutes and regulations in New Mexico. Isn't that correct? Uh, where I believe them to be relevant and to my understanding. Okay. Uh, but again, you're not an attorney, right? No, I'm not. So isn't it uh, correct that uh, Avangrid, uh, specifically, uh, Mr. Azagar Blasquez uh, specifically testified that uh, final approval of PM's proposed abandonment of Four Corners is not a condition for closing on the merger transaction. Objection. Objection. Okay, this is Mr. Marks. Um, objection Foundation. We don't know if this witness is aware of what Mr. Zagra has testified to. And I would object as well, um, based on another ground, which is I believe that Mr. Alvidrez has misstated the testimony of Mr. Velasquez. And I, I specifically asked him about that. Let, let me ask, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, let's start with Mr. Marx's uh, objection. Uh, yeah, lays the foundation, please. Um, yeah, of course. Um, Dr. Fisher, have you uh, reviewed the, the testimony of Mr. Zagreb Blaskas that's been filed in this case? Uh, I believe I reviewed the testimony, um, but it's been a little while. I do recall that uh, he testified that um, was not uh, necessary 
as a condition for closing that uh, P&M obtain final approval of abandonment of Four Corners? I apologize, I don't have his testimony in front of me, but I can get it if you'd like me to. That's and right. I object again, because I don't think that that is what Mr. Blaska says in his testimony. Well, let's look at um, Joint Applicant Exhibit 2, which is the, the stipulation that also includes the regulatory commitments. Uh, do you have that uh, handy? Dr. Fisher? Uh, I'm sorry, uh, I'm not actually clear on exhibit numbering uh, at the moment. Um, and which, what which... this is, uh, it's joint applicant exhibit two and it's the notice of filing stipulation, a second amendment stipulation that um, was uh, filed in this case on June 4. Hey, Mr. Albedros, if I could just assist so we can get there. Mr. Fisher, he's just asking for the second amended stipulation, which you I do have that, yes. To. Yes, I do. Thank you. Have you found that? I believe I have what you're referring to. Okay, and I think you may have made um, some uh, reference to this already. And if you could go to page 26 and paragraph 52. Do you see that? Yes, I'm there. And the last two sentences, um, can you read those into the record for us? Uh, I read, the parties agree that until the closing of the proposed transaction, either a non-decision or a dismissal of case number 210017UT will not affect this merger. Events that occur okay. after Events that occur after closing of the proposed transaction in that case, number 210017UT will not be deemed to have an impact on the merger. Okay, and can I have you uh, look at joint applicant exhibit six? And that is the um, uh, testimony of Mr. Uh, Zagreb Blaskes in support of second amended stipulation. I apologize. I'm afraid I actually do not have that sitting in front of me, but I can get there within a couple of moments. Okay. And just for clarification, you're asking for the direct testimony of Mr. Blasco's with respect. One of his direct testimonies, it's uh, with direct respect testimony to support of June 18th testimony. Have you found that? I have, yes. Could I have you uh, turn to page uh, 29 in that testimony? Beginning at line 21. Just a moment, please. Uh, my computer is being just a little laggy. Bear with me. Okay. Uh, testimony page 29. Yes, beginning at line 21. Do you see that? Uh, reading, there have been statements. Yes, can you read that uh, question and the uh, answer on the following page into the record? Uh, there have been statements that the proposed transaction is dependent upon PNM obtaining approval to abandon the Four Corner Power Plant and to securitize the related cost. Are these statements correct? Answer as well. Please. Answer no. As provided for in commitment number 52, joint applicants agree that either a non Can you start again? Answer no, as provided for. Sorry. And uh, read slowly. No, as provided for in commitment number 52, 
joint applicants agree that either a non-decision or a dismissal of case number 210017UT will not affect whether the proposed transaction moves forward. Additionally, in the same commitment, joint applicants state that in any event, in case number 21-00017UT that occurs after closing of the proposed transaction cannot have an impact on the merger. Thank you. Uh, does that uh, provide clarification on uh, the fact that final approval is, uh, of the abandonment is not uh, necessary, a condition of closing under the merger agreement? Uh, that is uh, what Mr. Blasquez says in that case. And, and conversely, uh, PM has also testified that uh, if for some reason this merger is not approved, that it's will continue uh, with its proposed abandonment of Four Corners, correct? Objection Foundation again. Are you aware, are you aware of PM's testimony to that effect? Uh, I am not. Okay. Well, let me move on a bit. And um, looking at page 10 of your uh, unit 18 testimony, it, uh, appears that you contend that condition 6.19 uh, and the associated transfer of PM's interest in Four Corners to Entec, in your words, may prolong the operation of the Four Corners power plant. Is that a fair understanding of your, your position? Uh, that is my testimony. Now, uh, if we actually look at section 6.19, one nine uh, on its face. There's nothing in in that provision that prohibits uh, PNM from voting on an early closure of the Four Corners power plant. Is that, is that true? Um, again, as I stated earlier, the mechanism of abandonment that's been put forward by PNM and the joint applicants in this case is a mechanism of compliance with this section six point one nine. And then I'll talk to you after, okay? Sorry, okay. there's noise in the background. Ms. Nanassi. I, I... Um, however, also it specifically says in 6.19 that the form of the exit is, quotes, substantially in the form made available to parent prior to the date of this agreement um, and is reasonably acceptable to the parent and then notes that those are called the Four Corners Divestiture Agreements, which I understand are effectively the abandonment proceeding and the purchase and sale agreement that accompanies that. So I believe yeah, that 6.19 directs towards the form of the abandonment that was put forward by PNM. Okay, At what, but actually the provision that um, includes the restriction on uh, PNM's voting is in the uh, purchase and sale agreement between PM and Entec, correct? Uh, that's correct. But again, that purchase and sale is noted almost directly in this section 6.19 and directed by 6.19. Right. And, and section, it, it's section 6.1 D1 of the Entec purchase and sale agreement. I'm sorry, D uh, or B? D is in David, one of the Entec Purchase and Sale Agreement that you quote at footnote 22 on page 12 of your testimony uh, that contains the voting restriction. Isn't that correct? Uh, yes. And the issue of whether the Entec Agreement, including uh, the section that uh, I just cited, uh, is in the public interest or not is currently being litigated in case 210017UT, correct? That's correct. In fact, you filed testimony in that case uh, challenging uh, whether the uh, PM Entec agreement is in the public interest based on that provision, correct? I did. And that case is going to hearing in just a few weeks from now, right? Uh, that's my understanding, yes. Now, uh, PM as a 13% minority owner in Four Corners has no authority to unilaterally require 
uh, the other owners to close the power plant early, correct? Uh, PNM is a 13% uh, co-owner, I agree. Um, and I don't believe that they have the unilateral authority to close the plant. And, and likewise, the commission doesn't have any authority to require the, the Four Corners owners to close the plant early, right? Uh, I agree. Uh, I want to look at a, a few more sections of your testimony. Uh, on pages 14 and 15 of your uh, testimony, you, you uh, I guess, offer up some uh, matters that you contend demonstrate that uh, the Four Corners abandonment is tied to the merger. Is that, that correct under that sub subsection small a? I'm sorry, can you just, I, I think I missed something in your question. Can you just restate that? Yes, on pages 14 and 15 of your uh, June direct testimony, you offer up certain matters that you contend demonstrate that the Four Corners abandonment is tied to the merger, correct? That's correct. And one of the, the things that you note uh, on page 15 is that uh, I think it's your, your second point to mid page. Do you see that it begins paragraph begins second PNM filed? Uh, yes, on page fourteen, I have it. Okay, it says second PNM filed for abandonment before it issued an RFP for replacement resources, right? Yes. Uh, but in fact, under section six point two of the uh, PNM and NTEC. Purchase and sale agreement. PNM was required uh, to file uh, for necessary regulatory approvals no later than March 30, 2021. Isn't that also correct? I'm sorry. Under which agreement, please? Under the PNM NTEC purchase and sale agreement. I apologize. I need to find that for myself. Don't have the clauses memorized. I apologize that I don't happen to have, unless I've attached it as an exhibit to my own, and I do not currently have the purchase and sale in front of me. So you're not able to confirm that? Um, I can do so subject to check, um, but I would like to ultimately check that. I'm willing to allow it to just move on. All right. Well, well, I don't want to take up uh, more more time on this since I have limited time. I would I'm like sorry. you to turn to page uh, 15 of your testimony. And there, uh, the paragraph that precedes, you know, the fourth item that you talk about, you said uh, in early December 2019, PNM shared with Avangrid. Do you see that uh, last sentence there? Uh, yes. In early uh, December 2019, PNM shared with Avangrid a presentation on its quote project, project Roadrunner close quote that stated PNM's plan was to exit Four Corners between 2026, 2031. Do you see that? I do see that. Yes. And you provide a footnote um, that references PNM response to Sierra Club S to SC16 in the uh, abandonment case, right? Yes. And you uh, find where in uh, that uh, discovery response, which you've attached, uh, I believe, as uh, 
uh, Sierra Club Exhibit JIF-8. Uh, that appears. Uh, the language that I find within that agreement or within that presentation um, says uh, in several instances uh, that the agreement expires in 2031, although PNM plans to uh, plans to exit sooner. But well, you provided a specific date range of between. Uh, 2026, right, and 2035. I did. Well, let, let um, me the, move on. Oh, go ahead. Uh, sorry. Um, I do have on page 10 of that exhibit a contemplation of early retirement of 200 megawatts um, of Four Corners power plant June 1st, 2023. And right, then... and that, that's, that's really what I wanted to direct your attention to. In, in fact, what this uh, presentation talks about is a, an earlier exit date of June 1, 2023, right? It does say that, yes. And this whole slide, uh, page 10, sort of lays out a schedule, uh, a potential schedule for the proposed early retirement of Four Corners and the re replacement resources, right? Uh, and as far as I understand, with replacement power, um, it just says that they would be would meet capacity and RPS requirements and gives a total estimated investment, but it does not specify what types of replacement resources. Right, but it does provide. It says they would anticipate filing um, in September uh, of 2021 uh, a uh, proposed uh, proposed replacement uh, resources. Correct. Uh, I'm sorry, I see September 1st, 2020 filing. I'm sorry, yes, 20, uh, September 1, 2020 was when they would have, were anticipating uh, seeking approval for uh, replacement resources, right? I do see that, yes. And, and that was a separate proceeding from the abandonment filing, which they anticipated uh, filing on April 1st, 2020, correct? Uh, yes. You have five minutes, Mr. Alvedrus. Yes, thank you. Uh, and so, uh, I mean, clearly from this, back in December of 2019, PNM was looking at a uh, earlier filing date for abandonment than it actually filed. Isn't that correct? Yes, but at this point, it was also a both an abandonment proceeding and a replacement power proceeding that would be fairly closely coupled to each other um, by the order of about a half a year in preparation for a retirement, and it doesn't say abandonment, it says retirement of Four Corners in 2023. 
And, and you um, understand PNM is going to be filing a uh, an a, a, a case to uh, for replacement resources, uh, maybe by the end of this year or very early next year. Correct. I don't have specific knowledge of when it's planning on filing that case. However, to complete the answer that I wanted to give just a moment ago, um, the fact that this had a June 2023 date is actually what's relevant to the testimony that I filed um, of stating that the closer coupling here between a 2020 uh, replacement resources and a June 2023 retirement is more appropriately coupled to the abandonment and retirement proceeding, as I understand it, um, than a early 2021 uh, filing for abandonment for an end of 2024 uh, removal of that plant, right? So what I discuss in my testimony is specifically the distance between those cases, the fact that the abandonment is being filed now for an abandonment that would actually happen four years from the time of that abandonment is what's of import here. And that the move th th that timing is specifically driven by this avant grid merger. So you've got uh, a three year uh, filing space uh, that had been proposed in uh, or that had been discussed in Exhibit Ten. Is that right? Three year between uh, a little more than three years. They filed April 2021 for a planned abandonment in uh, June of 2023. So it's a little more than three years, right? Uh, and closure, according to this uh, slide. Well, um, actually, if you look down at the uh, negotiations underway for early exit, it says early exit, right? I do see that, yep. And it says that they are in discussions with the Navajo Nation on taking PNM's interest in the plant, which is ultimately what uh, occurred through NTEC, right? And it also says, in the, I agree with that, and it also says in the bullet prior to that, um, discussions with Arizona Public Service Company regarding early retirement currently ongoing. So they were looking at both options at that time, right? That's right. So um, finally, you uh, state on page... Um, 28 of your testimony that uh, the proposed, that the merger proposes a risk of increased greenhouse gas emissions because PNM currently anticipates replacing Four Corners with new gas fired plants, right? I do state that, yes. Uh, but in fact, PNM hasn't filed uh, any request for approval of any new resources. Isn't that correct? I'm sorry, I, you, you faded out requests for. In fact, PNM has not uh, even filed uh, for any replacement resources with respect to the abandonment of Four Corners. Isn't that correct? Uh, no, it is not. However, within the abandonment proceeding, the testimony and uh, work papers underlying that of, I think, Mr. Phillips, uh, the resource planner for Public Service New Mexico, contemplates replacement with gas resources. Well, isn't it true that what he presented was what he characterized as a pro as proxy portfolios? Uh, yes, but those proxy portfolios are the best that we have to work with right now, pending any other information put forward by the company. And he put forth a proxy portfolio of all non-combustion resources as, as one of the uh, options that were analyzed. Isn't that correct? Uh, I don't have a specific recollection at this moment of the set of portfolios that were put forward, but I believe that the most cost-effective portfolio found by Mr. Phillips and at least presented as the basis of the largest dollar reason why the abandonment made sense for PNM's customers uh, included gas resources. But he presented a range, did he not, of savings? Uh, he did. That, and and the, the lower end of the range uh, was the all um, non-combustion portfolio, correct? I believe that the range was defined by a number of factors, including different compliance options, different replacement portfolios, different carbon pricing options, different gas price options. So I can't state decisively that the lower range of that option was due to renewable energy or not. And didn't uh, Mr. Phillips make clear in his testimony that 
TNM was not presenting any proposed replacement resources and wouldn't do so until it's completed uh, its RFP and filed a case for uh, approval of proposed replacement resources. I don't have that testimony in front of me. And finally, isn't it true that even if PM did present uh, a portfolio that included gas plants, uh, the only way it could do so would be with the approval mission? Uh, for yes, um, th that is my understanding. Um, however, that is, I think, irrespective of how it would characterize its own emissions burden. Um, and here, the specific statement that I'm making is with respect to if Four Corners is moved to another owner, it will continue combusting, and then additional gas that would then get owned by PNM would be additional and incremental to those emissions on the state of New Mexico. But that's only if PNM replaced the, four, the retired, uh, or not retired, but the uh, transferred interest in Four Corners with a gas plant, right? The best possible outcome with the transfer of Four Corners to a different owner and its continued combustion is that PNM invests solely in non emitting resources and somehow contributes to the reduction of Four Corners combustion. I'm sorry, sir. I'm uh, sorry. Invests solely in. So, uh, solely in non emitting resources and contributes to the reduction of emissions in Four Corners. But that is entirely speculative. And at the moment, the most likely outcome here is that a movement of four corners to a different set of co-owners and then incremental gas from public service New Mexico would result in net increase in emissions. And whereas a retirement of four corners and a replacement with clean energy or even clean energy and some element of gas, not preferentially, would result in a substantial reduction of emissions. That's not contemplated in this filing, and it's not contemplated by the merger. Well, it, it's not contemplated that PNM um, would necessarily replace Four Corners with gas generation in the pending abandonment case, right? I, it, it is one of the pieces of information that has been put forward by Mr. Phillips, and it would be what I would characterize as what he's shown as the most cost-effective portfolio thus far, but there is nothing currently in the record as to what that replacement portfolio might be. Thank you. Hey, uh, Mr. Uh, Marks, do you have any redirect? Uh, a, a few questions, thank you. Uh, Mr. Fisher, can you look at... Uh, or you probably still have it up, uh, JAF step eight, those, those slides. And if you can look at page six of 23. Is that J-I-F? Dash S-T-I-P dash eight. Uh, You're which page, please? Mr. Yeah, which page, please? Page six of 23. I'm there, yes. Okay. Uh, do you see uh, uh, an annotation for a time period when PNM in this slide says it would end exit four corners? Uh, in the central set of bullets, it says between 2026 and 2035, exit four corners as the first sub bullet. Okay. Is is that responsive to Mr. Alvedris's question of where in this exhibit you got your numbers, your dates 2026 through 2031? Yes. Okay. And do you, uh, uh, it, it, it's correct, isn't it, that this exhibit is actually two sets of slides? Uh, it is, yes. Okay. Can you look at uh, page nine of 23? I'm there. Okay. And what's that slide titled? 
Uh, this refers to the San Juan abandonment, securitization, and replacement power. Okay, and slide 10 is the one that I think uh, Mr. Albedras referred you to, correct? That's correct. And it's titled Four Corners Abandonment, Securitization, and Replacement? Yes. Okay, can you look at page 20? <clears throat> I'm there. Does that look familiar? Uh, it also says San Juan abandonment, securitization, and replacement power. It, does that appear to be the same as slide nine? Uh, at the surface, it does. Okay. And what's the following page? Uh, the following page uh, is recommended replacement power scenario details. Okay. And can you continue? Is there anything about Four Corners being retired in 2023 in this package of slides? The equivalent of that page 10? Uh, not with the level of detail that was provided in that slide previously. I mean, it, uh, the, uh, it was provided in the prior presentation that was, I believe, on slide uh, page 10 of 23. Okay. And, and Mr. Fisher, you called that the prior, pres prior presentation. Uh, I assume you're referring to the order they appear in this exhibit, but in terms of dates, do you know which one? Sorry, I, I, I assume you're referring to, and I missed it. Oh, I'll speak slower. I assume you're referring to the order that the pages appear in this exhibit as provided by PNM, uh, but in terms of dates, which one is earlier? Um, it's actually unclear to me, but I imagine that actually the second one is earlier. The first, the second slide deck within this exhibit, which begins on page, excuse me, which begins on page 15 of 23 is labeled as December 2nd, 2019. And the slide deck prior, which begins on page two of 23 is uh, called Project Roadrunner and it is just labeled December, 2019. And, and is there a transmission email before that that has a date? There is. The, What's that uh, date? The, it is labeled December 3rd, 2019. Okay. okay. And then uh, Mr. Alvidras asked you whether, well, whether you knew if the, the dates for filing were, uh, were contractually agreed upon between PNM and NTC and the uh, purchase and sale agreement. And that explains why PNM had to file for abandonment before it did an RFP for replacement resources. Do you agree that that provision or that that's a good reason why PNM had to file for abandonment before uh, having replacement resources. I'm going to object. Uh, the witness hasn't had a chance to review. He said the reference pr provision. He accepted it subject to check. So, so my question is, if that's what the agreement actually says, is that a good reason? An agreement between PNM and NTEC for uh, timing. The agreement as uh, put forward between PNM and NTEC um, stands on its or stood on its own right. Again, as I stated in, so, so no, um, as I stated in um, my testimony, I believe that the form of that agreement was accelerated and put forward by the merger, um, but that agreement could have happened at any time. Um, and so is not necessarily uh, the basis by which the order of operations needed to occur. And then needed Mr. To, I'm sorry, needed to occur. Thank you. 
And then Mr. Alvidris began by referring you to the, the language in merger condition 6.19 and to what the stipulating parties have agreed to. Uh, and, and I think it would be fair to characterize the conclusion he led you to, which is that the problems with four corners could be cured uh, by the commission's rejecting the application in case 21 triple zero 17, uh, correct? Correct. Okay. Uh, is it also your testimony that, uh, I think it was also your testimony, P and M is trying to get the merger, get the sale to NTEC approved in 21 17 in the other case, uh, and that is a theoretical possibility in that case, even though you oppose it, correct? That's correct. Okay. And is it your opinion that the commission could cure the problem in this case? Uh, possibly not in full, um, but the uh, merger provision 6.19 that we've been referring to could be cured by saying, um, I believe I put it in my testimony, that it would direct um, the joint applicants to uh, modify the merger commitment condition 6.19, such that it would, such that PNM's exit from Four Corners could not preclude PNM from voting to close the plant or reduce the output of the plant. Uh, do, you, do you consider Clause 6.19 to be moved? Not yet, no. No. Uh, it, would you agree if PM and Avangrid don't need the commission to approve the abandonment in order to have their merger, they could just withdraw that? Yes. Request? Okay. Uh, Mr. Mr. Michael asked you about leakage. Uh, is it possible, well, is leakage something that just occurs within the boundaries of the state of New Mexico? No. No. Uh, are the effects of greenhouse gas emissions localized? Not at all. They're no. global in nature. So uh, it, 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 is it any better if Four Corners continues to emit and the power gets transmitted to Arizona or Utah or some other state? Uh, no, and as I discussed with uh, um, the other attorneys, that outcome would likely be a net increase in overall emissions and leakage from the system. Uh, given New Mexico's ETA and the zero carbon standard, is, is that scenario actually more likely than a scenario in which it supplies another New Mexico retail load? It is entirely feasible, yes, that you okay. could have a New Mexico plant supplying out-of-state customers. Okay. And uh, would, would your recommendations for, for a requirement in Avangrid recognize both scope one and scope three, and I guess also scope two, two emissions, would that address the various dimensions of this issue of having to do with in-state and out-of-state emissions from a, a, a plant that's been spun off by Avangrid? I think it would be a partial cure in much the same way that Avangrid has, I think, fairly firmly stated that its corporate commitment to its climate goals, which are again, scope one and scope two, are so meaningful that um, they would drive uh, this type of um, divestiture agreement um, and play actually fairly prominently in Avant Grid's um, information that it puts before investors as well as SEC filings. I think if that commitment included scope three emissions, 
then avant-grid would quickly find itself precluded from taking shortcut outcomes like this divestiture that simply pass the problem to a different party instead of addressing it itself. And, and then specifically on merger commitment 44 uh, with the incentives, um, would it be possible for that commitment to have incentives to be tied to both the 2035 uh, zero carbon goal that the joint applicants have admirably put forward, but also address leakage? Of course. Okay. Mr. Marsh, we haven't had to deal with this issue uh, previously because redirect is relatively short, but my pre-hearing order said redirect is limited to 10 minutes. I'm, I'm done. You're done, okay, good. Yes. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Fisher, you're excused. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Mr. Albright, uh, I believe you're next with uh, Ms. Reno. Um, Mr. Schanauer, um, at this point, um, Ms. Beatles is going to resume representing WRA here, and I okay. will, uh, so she should be in the waiting room soon, and I will go ahead and exit. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Don't see her yet. Okay. Uh, let me just, I know she's uh, available. Let me just see if, uh, if she's, uh, if we can get her to the waiting room. Or to log in here. I admitted Maureen Reno a little while ago. But I don't see her now. I also don't see Miss Fields. It's Mr. Lesky. Here's Miss Reno. She should be appearing on our screens somewhere. There she is. Okay, uh, Mr. Lee, do you want to swear Ms. Reno in? And Ms. Reno, you need to unmute your... Uh... There you go. Ms. Reno, would you raise your right hand, please? You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give to the matter of opinion it shall be the truth, full truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you, ma'am. Good afternoon, Ms. Reno. Good afternoon. Uh, would you please uh, state your name, place of employment, and address for the record, please? Yes, my name is Maureen Reno. I'm an economist and independent consultant. I'm also principal and owner of Reno Energy Consulting Services, LLC. And my business address is 19 Hope Hill Road, Derry, New Hampshire. Can you spell the name of the, of the road? I'm sorry, it's two words. Hope, H-O-P-E. Second word, Hill, H-I-L-L. -L. Thank you. You're welcome. And on whose behalf are you testifying today? Bernalillo County. Did you prepare pre-filed testimony in this proceeding? Yes, I did. And can you confirm that what has been marked as BC Exhibit 1 is your corrected direct testimony on behalf of Bernalillo County dated April 5? 2021, but filed in the record on April 6, 2021? Yes. Do you have any changes or corrections to that testimony? No, I do not. If uh, you were asked the same questions today as were asked at the time you prepared your direct testimony, would your answers be the same? Yes. And is the information contained in BC Exhibit 1 and the attachments thereto true and correct to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes. Uh, Mr. Hearing Examiner, at this time, I move for the admission of Bernalillo County Exhibit 1. Is there any objection? Um, hearing none, uh, Bernalillo County Exhibit 1 is admitted. 
And Ms. Reno, um, you also prepared rebuttal testimony of Maureen L. Reno of April 21, 2021, correct? Yes. And that's identified as BC Exhibit 2 in this proceeding. <clears throat> yes. And was that corrected or was that uh, testimony, the rebuttal testimony of April 21, prepared under your supervision, direction, and control? Yes, it was. Do you have any changes or corrections to that testimony? No, I do not. If you were asked the same questions today as you were asked at the time you prepared that testimony, would your answers be the same? Yes. And is the information contained in Bernalillo County Exhibit uh, 2 and the attachments there to true and correct to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes. Uh, Mr. Hearing Examiner, on behalf of Bernalillo County, I move for the admission of Bernalillo County Exhibit 2. Is there any objection? Hearing no objection, uh, Bernalillo County Exhibit 2 is admitted. And Ms. Reno, you also have before you what's been labeled as BC Exhibit 3, the testimony with respect to the second amended stipulation testimony filed July 16, 2021. Do you have that before you? Yes, I do. And um, was that testimony prepared under your supervision, direction, and control? Yes. Do you have any changes or corrections to that testimony? No, I do not. If you were asked the same questions today as were asked at the time you prepared testimony with respect to the second amended stipulation, would your answers be the same? Yes, they would. And is the information contained in BC Exhibit 3 and the attachments there to true and correct to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes. Mr. Hearing Examiner, on behalf of Bernalillo County, I move for the admission of Bernalillo County Exhibit 3. Is there any objection? Hearing no objection, Bernalillo County Exhibit 3 is admitted. <clears throat> Uh, Ms. Reno, we also have Bernalillo County Exhibit 9A and 9B. Uh, do you have those before you? Yes, I do. And those were documents from the previous proceeding PRC case number 15-00327-UT. Is that correct? Yes. And those involved Amera, uh, Amera's acquisition of Tico with Amera assuming ownership of New Mexico Gas Company, which was owned by Tico, is that correct? Yes. And to the best of your knowledge, those are accurately um, obtained from the uh, docket, the e-docket of the New Mexico Public Regulation Commission, correct? Yes. And those are, as far as you know, are true and correct copies of those, correct? Yes. And you use those from time to time with regard to uh, preparation of your own uh, testimony in the hearing today, correct? Yes. Uh, Mr. Hearing Examiner, at this time, I move for the admission of Bernalillo County Exhibits 9A and 9B. Is there any objection? Okay, hearing no objection, uh, Bernalillo County Exhibits 9A and 9B are admitted. And with that, Mr. Uh, hearing examiner, I offer the uh, witness for cross-examination. Okay, uh, first on the list that I have is uh, WRA. Uh, Ms. Beatles, do you have cross for this witness? Yes, I do, Your Honor. Thank you. I'm ready. You reserved uh, 25 minutes. Go ahead. Um, good morning, Dr. Reno. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Sydney Beatles, and I am representing Western Resource Advocates here in this hearing. Um, did you listen yesterday to the testimony of WRA witness, Dr. Doug Howe? Uh, yes, I did. And did you listen yesterday to the testimony of PNM witness, Todd Fridley? Uh, yes, I think so. 
Do you agree that a regional transmission organization operates and plans transmission over a large regional footprint? Yes, I do. Do you agree that no one utility can create and control a regional transmission organization? Uh, yes, I do, but it would also take cooperation with other utilities and other stakeholders besides just utilities in and of themselves. It would require the participation of other stakeholders uh, such as independent generators, um, customer groups, state commissions, and other neutral parties that would incorporate all um, stakeholders' interests And whether the development of a regional transmission organization that includes New Mexico is led by the commission or multiple entities and stakeholders as you just described or their participation, do you agree that it would be a benefit? And I'm going to quote Dr. Howe from, you don't need to look it up right now unless it's at your fingertips, from page nine of his testimony in support of the stipulation. So do you agree that it would be a benefit that if p and were at the table in the development of a Western RTO, fighting for the best deal available for its customers and also looking out for and incorporating into RTO design, the economic development interest of the state? Uh, if you want me to break so, that down, I will. <laughs> well, I'm just trying to figure out um, which testimony of Mr. Howes are you referring to? I am referring to his testimony in support of the stipulation exhibit five. And uh, page nine of his testimony in support of the stipulation lines seven through 11. Uh, Mr. Hearing Chairman, I'm just going to object for clarification. If, if she can, if Ms. Beatles can unpack that, uh, that question, I think it would be, be a little more helpful so I could understand it. Yes. So you just described Dr. Reno, a process for the development of a regional transmission organization in the West that would include New Mexico, correct? Yes. And that process should include all affected and interested parties. Is that correct? Yes. And do you agree that it would be a benefit if PNM were at the table and as described by Dr. Howe, PNM should be fighting for a, the best deal available for its customers and also looking out for and incorporating the economic development interest of the state. And I'm just asking whether you would agree that would be a benefit. Well, it, it depends because obviously you have PNM being only one of many investor owned utilities in the area um, and would be one of many stakeholders. So when you say looking out for PNM customer interests, um, the, the entity, the neutral entity that would be controlling this process or organizing this process would have to weigh not only the interests of p &M customers, but the interests of other utility customers, um, other participants in, in the transmission market in general, and then weigh whether it would be in the best interest. So this probably there'd probably be some circumstance where PNM customer interests 
um, might not be the end all be all in, in terms of determining what is in the public interest. Do you agree that it would be a benefit if PNM were part of that process and fighting for the best deal available for its customers? Well, it would. I'm sure PNM customers would benefit from that um, representation as opposed to not being included in that process. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm now going to address a different topic. Um, please refer to page 19 of your testimony with respect to the second amended stipulation. That's BC exhibit three. So please refer to page 19. A page again, please, Ms. Beatles. Page 19. Thank you. Just bear with me a minute. I have multiple. I'm accessing them on my screen and I have multiple um, documents open. We're, we're, we are talking about my July 16th testimony, correct? Yes. Okay. And you said what page again? Page 19. Okay. So starting on line 15, specifically the following line, you state that you are concerned that if regulatory commitments 43, 44, and 49 were approved as presented, they could possibly bind Bernalillo County to either certain legislative initiatives and or additional ratepayer expenses. Do you see that? Yes, I do. So, do you agree that with respect to the potential legislation that is identified in stipulation paragraph 43, do you agree that that paragraph also contains the following sentence? I will read it to you. The signatories reserve all positions on such legislation. I have to find that document. Okay. Well, uh, let me see here. I just wanna make sure we are discussing, you said commitment number 43, correct? That's correct. Okay. That's correct. That is the one with the heading carbon reduction task force. Just spare with me a second. Less than a minute. I'm getting there. Okay. So what sentence were you reading? Are First you there all, now? Yes, I am. So referring to paragraph 43 in the second amended stipulation, <clears throat> headed carbon reduction task force. I recognize I'm being a little repetitive, but <clears throat> I just want the record to be clear. Um, please go to the second to the last sentence of that paragraph. Okay, I think I'm there. And do you recognize that that sentence reads the signatories reserve all positions on such legislation. Uh, yes, I agree that's what it states. Um, and um, 
My concern is that um, elected officials of Bernalillo County um, would be, well, my, con my concern would be that um, despite that sentence that you just read into the record, um, that there are other, other statements in that paragraph that may bind elected officials of Bernalillo County to engage in legislative related processes that they did not agree to. And through the stipulation also binds other utilities and perhaps even electoral, electrical cooperatives to courses of actions that might be at odds with other existing statutes and rules. I'm just concerned here that we're not considering um, other interests at play. So what is your, what language in that paragraph is your concern with? Paragraph 43. Well, just the general mood of it. Um, I, I know that that sentence um, seems to be toward the end, um, but other language in the paragraph seems to imply a, a commitment that may bind uh, elected officials' hands. Um, I'm speaking of specifically in regard to my client, uh, elected officials in Bernalillo County. And um, what language um, causes you to um, to, to, to stay, to, 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 to identify a mood. <laughs> like what, what language in that paragraph um, conveys to you that there is anything that would tie the hands of elected officials or as you mentioned, co-ops. Um, just bear with me a minute. I'm, I would have to read through this paragraph. So specifically, maybe this will help. Um, is there any language in that paragraph that would tie the hands of or bind the or bind elected officials or rural electric cooperatives? Well, we haven't seen uh, the latest legislation, so I'm not in a position uh, to state um, one way or the other on behalf of Bernalillo County. So your concern is with the legislation and not with the Carbon Reduction Task Force, is that correct? Well, I have other issues with the task force. Um, but I thought we were talking in regard to the legislation. Um, well, you said it was the mood of the paragraph that caused you to have concerns about binding elected officials in co-ops. And the and, and, and would you agree that the purpose of the paragraph is to create a carbon reduction task force that 
provides comments and suggestions to PNM with respect to its plan. I'm sorry, I'm misunderstanding your question. Okay, so do you agree that paragraph, do you agree that paragraph 43, the language of paragraph 43 speaks for itself? No, I would not agree because um, the paragraph in its entirety um, sets PNM on a certain course of action um, that we have not seen the details of. And that's where I have concerns. Right, what course of action are you referring to? The Carbon Reduction Task Force? In, in terms of um, establishing some legislation that we have not seen details thereof. Okay, so your concern is not with the Carbon Reduction Task Force, your concern is with the legislation, is that correct? I'm going to eject uh, Mr. Schoenauer. The question's been asked and answered to the best of my client's ability and her understanding of the paragraph. Um, <clears throat> I'll let Ms. Beatles try and get uh, her answer uh, overruled. May so, I follow up? Or, well, I'm sorry, Dr. Reno, did you have a response or do you want me to try to help move this along? It's just that as I keep rereading this paragraph, what concerns me is that the Carbon Reduction Task Force itself commits participants into a certain course of action that uh, we have not seen the details thereof so I'm left concerned here that um, whatever is decided through this task force might bind the hands of elected Bernalillo County officials and engage in legislation related processes that they, did, that they have not agreed to. Referring to paragraph 43, the role of the Carbon Redu Reduction Task Force, and this is the, the fourth sentence from the end, about the middle of paragraph 43. Paragraph 43 says the PNM Carbon Reduction Task Force will provide comments and suggestions to PNM. To see, do you see that? Yes, I do. So providing comments and suggestions to PNM does not bind any party, is that correct? Um, I'm not entirely sure I would agree in the affirmative to that question. Okay, thank you. And then with respect to the legislation, the sentence following the reference to the legislation, it does state that the signatories reserve all positions. We've already established that, right? I see it written in the sentence. Thank you. Um, and so there's nothing in and of that, that language itself that binds elected officials. Is that correct? Well, they're um, like in the sentence above, for example, you know, as I, as I keep rereading, I'm, I'm finding more things that 
you know, I can't speak to um, in the affirmative because um, elected officials might be concerned with certain processes that they're that this paragraph commits to. Uh, for example, in this, the sentence above talks about creating a market-based credit program to achieve some goals. And although that being noble, um, I have personal experience in setting market-based credit programs. And I do know it's a very time-consuming, expensive process. Um, we're talking many stakeholders, we're talking many years. Uh, and that could, in the ballpark, could cost uh, around a million dollars or I'd have to see the, the details, right? And so given unknowns like that, where uh, my client doesn't know the specifics, I have problems agreeing with this paragraph because again, it would bind elected officials of Bernalillo County to commit to a processes that, that could cost ratepayers money in the end. So that's where I'm left when I see this paragraph. That's what caused me concern. So you have five minutes, Ms. Beatles. Okay, so you just wanna make sure that Bernalillo County elected officials are not bound to any position on any such legislation. Is that fair? No, I also speak in regard to any other participants that may be concerned by the increase of costs associated with um, setting up this task force and uh, a carbon trading program. Uh, it could be any other elected officials that have to take the larger picture in mind and um, make some specific judgments. Okay, so you just wanna make sure that no individual or entity is bound to any particular position on this legislation, is that right? Well, as it pertains to this merger and acquisition. Okay, so uh, one more question. Um, also on page 19, you say the additional compensation, I'm starting on line 18, for incentives and positions. Um, actually, could. Are we back to my testimony and which testimony? Yes. Um, the only testimony I've been asking questions of you about, Bernalillo County Exhibit 3, which is your testimony with respect to the second amended stipulation. It's your testimony dated July 16th. Okay, so, um, okay. Page 19. I'm there. And um, starting on line 18, you state that you have concerns about additional compensation for goals that are already statutorily mandated. Do you see that? Yes, I do. What statute are you referring to? Uh, what comes to mind is the Energy Transition Act that has okay. been on the books for quite some time already. And are you referring specifically to the zero carbon resource requirement by 2045 in that act? Yes, I am. And uh, you do recognize, right, that the stipulation states accelerates that requirement to 2040 or even earlier to 2035, if feasible and otherwise in the public interest? Yes. All right, I have no further questions, thank you. <clears throat> okay, we're gonna take a lunch break, uh, come back at uh, 1.15. Um, um, Mr. Herring, Examiner, Mr. Gould, if I could, yes. before we, we go off the record. Um, Mr. Gorman is standing by, so I just wanted to kind of do a quick check on where we were. We're done with WRA's cross of this witness, but uh, by my calculation, we still have uh, more than an hour and a half for Ms. Reno. Is that your understanding as well? Uh, your math is probably as good as mine, yes. I've got about 95 minutes, so... Um, 
And then for the the other witnesses that are going to go today, uh, are we still are we going to have uh, Carol Davis, David Arthur, and Vince Tumorello, or yes. did we get rid of some of those? No, we're still having those. And as I count it, there's less than a half hour of cross for each one of those witnesses. Do you know if any of that has been waived? Does anybody did I miss anybody's waiver of those those cross times? Uh, that's all uh, Bernalillo County, and uh, so I understand that there's no waiver there. Is that right? That is correct, Mr. Hearing Examiner. Okay. Well, with that, I can give Mr. Gorman a, a rough idea of when his testimony might might be required. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Hearing Examiner Richard Virtue for Los Alamos and MSR. I had indicated earlier <laughs> that uh, my witnesses are available after 4 p.m. today. Um, is it your intent to uh, call them after 4 p.m. If, if, if we have time? Well, it probably makes sense to uh, put uh, Mr. Gorman in there after Carol Davis. Uh, well, let's see how the timing goes. I mean, if yes, after four, my intent is to get them in today after four. Okay, thank you. So we'll try and get Mr. Gorman in there if we can between Carol Davis and those witnesses. Uh, Mr. Hearing Examiner Kyle Tisdale for community groups. Um, I just wanted to inform you and the rest of the parties that um, my co-counsel, Allie Beasley, will be taking over for the afternoon. Okay, that's fine. Okay, we're in recess till uh, 1.15.
David, how does, uh, this is uh, Mr. Albright here. Uh, how's the volume, is it okay? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir, appreciate it. Okay. Have you got questions for this witness? Um, Maureen is my witness. So oh, she, that's right. She's on behalf of the county. So I think we were, we were just beginning to go through the people who have signed up for cross here. So next should be CCAE, I think. Let me make sure that Marine's available there. Looks like she's waiting. Oh, there she comes. I am now unmuted. Okay. As am I. Are you up next, Ms. Zer? Yes, sir, Mr. Lee. Thank you, ma'am. <clears throat> when you're ready, Judge. Okay, I'm ready and uh, looks like we have who we need to have. Uh, so uh, next up for uh, cross-examination is uh, CCAE, uh, and you've reserved uh, 20 minutes, Miss Sir. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon, Ms. Serino. I'm Stephanie Zur with Coalition for Clean Affordable Energy. And I'm uh, looking at two documents I want to refer to to ask you questions. One of them is the second amended stipulation, which is Joint Applicant Exhibit 2, and your rebuttal testimony. Do you have those before you? Yes, I do. I'm just verifying I have them open on my desktop. Okay. Yes, I, okay. All right. Excuse me a second. I need to turn off my phone. Good idea. Okay. So let's start with your, um, your testimony. And I'm at page um, 18. Um, going back to the part of your testimony you were discussing with Miss Beatles, uh, about regulatory commitments 43, 44, and 49. So I wanna start with um, your question and answer. Um, what is your opinion with respect to, this is a bottom of 19. What is your opinion with respect to regulatory commitments 43, 44, and 49? And uh, you begin by saying, while these commitments have worthy aspirational goals and address the interests of a particular signatory to the second amended stipulation, I am concerned that if approved as presented, they could possibly bind Bernalillo County to either certain legislative initiatives and or additional ratepayer expenses. So I wanna start by asking you about what do you mean by while these commitments have worthy aspirational goals? Now, I'm not asking you about your objections at this point, and we'll get to that. I just like you to explain to me what you mean by these being uh, worthy goals. 
Well, in terms of uh, meeting the requirements under the Energy Transition Act, uh, the goals set out there, um, being reaching a point of carbon neutrality, neutrality. I think that's what I was referring to when I wrote this. It, it sounds to me like you're actually referring to paragraphs 43, 44, and 49, because you say these commitments have worthy aspirational goals. So could you tell me why you believe these commitments are worthy aspirational goals? That was your testimony. Um, well, it, it, it seems that um, you know, the desire to create a uh, carbon reduction task force, right, the purpose of which to um, reach and reach the goals set in the Energy Transition Act. Um, I think that's what I was referring to, right, the, the end means is um, to meet those goals in that legislation. Okay, but you'll note that the uh, paragraphs 43, 44, and 49 don't refer to the Energy Transition Act. And your testimony is about the, the goals and the commitments being worthy. The commitments being those in paragraphs 43, 44, and 49. So do you, wanna, do you have an answer to how those commitments are worthy goals? Well, I, I, I was referring to um, the desire of the signatories, right, to set these motion, these, um, these commitments into action uh, may seem worthy, um, but I do wanna stress though, that these were commitments um, that were agreed to via signatories to the second amended stipulation. And um, al although they, they appear to seem like worthy, uh, a, a worthy goal is, we, we do need to keep in mind though, um, that what was expressed in those paragraphs, the setting of the task force, um, e executive incentives to, um, become carbon neutral, uh, setting up a carbon um, trading market, carbon trading market. Uh, these are all the desires and, and within the interests of signatories. What concerns me, and as I was saying in response um, earlier this afternoon is that it leaves out the interests of the non-signatories to the second amended stipulation. And The, the non-signatories had, had, were not included in these conversations. Um, and as a result, um, their interests were not reflected. And uh, it's, it's the mechanism in which we're trying to incorporate these, the creation of these task force via um, the stipulation for this merger. I feel that a more appropriate mechanism to do this is would be a separate proceeding, perhaps a rulemaking, where all parties, all interested parties, signatories, non-signatories, could could be involved in the process um, and involve also public input by and from relevant stakeholders. Uh, it's just not appropriate to include these paragraphs in this merger stipulation because it deprives the public and the relevant stakeholders the opportunity to provide input and review um, the proposed processes, rules, and outcomes uh, that the stakeholder that's being established through these commitments uh, would lay out. 
Would Bernalillo County like to be a stakeholder and participate in the Carbon Reduction Task Force? And wouldn't that address your concern? Provided that um, this, this Carbon Reduction Task Force was created via another mechanism, say a public rulemaking brought to the PRC, um, as it's laid out in this uh, second amended stipulation, uh, I, don't, I don't, you know, they didn't sign it. Uh, they weren't involved in drafting these paragraphs. Other parties weren't involved in drafting these paragraphs. So I feel like um, their interests are not reflected here. Um, also, you know, it's, it would ultimately be um, the decision of the elected uh, county officials. Nobody stopped Bernalillo County from participating in settlement negotiations and drafting of these paragraphs, did they? I did not say that somebody stopped them. I'm just saying that they were not a signatory to this settlement. And I, I feel it to be disingenuous. Um, th these, these commitments, um, 43, 44, and 49, should really be vetted out as part of a public rulemaking process, not as included as a condition to a settlement in a merger case. I just feel it's displaced. So you also expressed concerns about ratepayers having to have their bills increased as a result of executive compensation. That was your testimony? Yes, I believe I said I, that's a fair representation because what concerns me. Um, well, let me ask you answer my question. Let me go ahead and ask my next question. Um, have Mr. You Hearing heard, Examiner. Uh, go ahead and finish. Right. Go, ahead. go ahead. She answered my question, but go ahead. I'll, I'll withdraw that. No, I was just going to, to we have uh, allowed other speakers to explain right. their answers. And okay. Ms. I, I agree, go ahead, Ms. Reno. Uh, okay, thanks. Uh, well, what concerns me is that um, there's the, the cost associated with the um, executive compensation associated with setting these goals. Uh, I, I believe one of the paragraphs also establishes um, a chief environmental officer uh, with executive com compensation uh, and, and the costs associated with setting up a, a carbon trading program. I, it seems to me that all these costs of, of trying to become greener uh, would be borne by ratepayers. And I, um, that leaves me very concerned because um, again, uh, we, we have no idea of the details. Uh, the signatories are committing to something. We don't, um, we, we don't know the specific monetary and financial impacts of this. And um, if we were to, to lay this out and examine it closely, it could negate the other net financial benefits that, we, that have been laid out so far in this settlement and throughout the testimony in this hearing. Okay, can I ask my next question? Are you finished? Yes. Okay, so if you look at paragraph 44, it says ex accordingly, incentive compensation for all relevant PM executives will include goals related to achievement of PM's 2040 carbon reduction targets. I would just point out to you. It just changes what they have to do to receive incentive compensation. It doesn't say their compensation increases, does it? Paragraph 44, look at it. What sentence are you referring to? The entire paragraph does not say their compensation will increase. It just makes carbon reduction one of the uh, um, criteria for earning and achieving the compensation. It doesn't say increases compensation.
it, it, it's, it, I get what you're trying to convey here, but the issue is it doesn't say by how much relative to what they already are receiving in terms of compensation. There are details here that I'm not privy to, or my client is, wasn't privy to as a non-signatory to this uh, agreement. So you say you're concerned about details that are not in, so paragraph 44 does not say anything about increasing executive compensation, does it? Will you agree with me there? I keep rereading re the same sentences and- And you don't see that, do you? But it doesn't say it wouldn't increase. But it doesn't say it will either. It doesn't address. It's, a, it's much, vague. It? To okay. me, it's vague. Okay. Let me just go to the last sentence of uh, paragraph 44. All parties reserve all rights with respect to the prudence of any additional expenditures in conjunction with this provision. So would you agree that paragraph 44 does not bind Bernalillo County to challenging, uh, to challenge the prudence of any increased expense? If there is one. You can still challenge that, right? It, it depends on what you mean by all parties. Are you talking about all signatories to this agreement? No, I'm talking about the language of the last sentence of paragraph 44. All parties, that includes Bernalillo County, reserve all rights with respect to the prudence of any additional expenditures in conjunction with this provision. Again, when you say all parties, do you mean signatories to this agreement? When you no, say- I No, I don't. I mean all parties, not all signatories. Well, let's just, do you have an answer? To me, when I'm getting some feedback, first of all, I find that a little distracting, but when I read a legal document and I'm not an attorney and it says all parties, it, I assume, the parties that signed that legal document. So since Bernalillo County did not sign this document, I'm assuming that they're not one of the parties that are referred to in this last sentence of paragraph 44. Okay. I'm also I'll assuming I'm also assuming that it's leaving out other non-signatories, other parties and interests that were not included in negotiating the terms of the second amended stipulation. I'll accept your answer that you don't, you're not sure all parties include and we'll move on. That's your answer. And I'm I sorry, you broke up. Not all parties include. All parties includes Bernalillo County. That's her, that's your opinion. All parties would not include the non-signatories that were not included in the negotiations of the second amended stipulation. Okay, and I, and I understand. You're just telling me what that language means to you. So if it's okay with you, I'm gonna move on to another question. Um, you have three minutes, Ms. Sir. Thank you. Um, with regard to your contention, your concern that Bernalillo County, um, with, let's see, that paragraphs 43, 44, 49 could possibly bind Bernalillo County to certain legislative initiatives. Bern Bernalillo County is not a signatory to the stipulation, correct? Yes, that's correct. And um, if the commission approved the merger, including the second amendment amended stipulation, that order would not order or require Bernalillo County to do anything with regard to legislative initiatives, right? That would be my understanding. All right, thank you, madam. Um, I have no further questions. Okay, thank you. Um, Attorney General, you have reserved 20 minutes.
I see Mr. Getko, are you? Yeah, yes, I'm sorry, hearing examiner, it went off and on on me. Uh, our questions have been answered, and so we are going to waive cross of this witness. Okay. Uh, Mr. Lesky, you have uh, reserved five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Hearing Examiner. Um, good afternoon, Ms. Reno. My name is Justin Lesky. I represent IBEW Local 611. That's the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. And I wanted to ask you just a couple of, of quick questions related to pages five and six in your July 16th testimony that I believe that's Bernalillo County Exhibit 3. Um, okay. Uh, that was my testimony that I submitted on July 16th. Yes, ma'am. And you said pages five and six? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I think I'm there. Okay. Um, in this section, you're discussing a uh, regulatory commitment to from the second amended stipulation, correct? Yes. Um, and what I'm focused in on are the 20 jobs at PNM um, that are a part of the uh, 150 new jobs that have been proposed. Um, and, and what the second amended stipulation states re relating to those jobs are that no more than 20 of these jobs will be at PNM. Joint applicants will target 20 of these jobs. To Sorry, be I, I'm 20 of these jobs will be. No more. Joint applicants will target 20 of these jobs to be electric service business unit craftsmen at PNM and will prioritize hiring personnel that have been or will be displaced as a result of San Juan generating station closure for those positions. Do you recall that from the second amended stipulation? Uh, let me open the second amended stipulation, which we were just discussing. I just wanna make sure I understand the language that okay. you're reading um, before I agree to it. I think that's what you're asking me to do. Um, so what specific sentences are you referring to? Uh, I'm, I'm referring to the last couple of sentences in the first bullet point in okay. paragraph two. So that starts on page one and runs into page Correct. two? Correct. Okay. Are you there? Yes, I'm there. Okay. Um, and, and what I wanted to ask you about is um, what you state on page six is, is a modification to that provision that states PNM will create at least 20 new full-time jobs for electric service craftsmen, right? Uh, if you're referring to my language on page five, I am, I page believe. Six. I'm sorry, it's on page six, the language. Oh. Oh, where I'm proposing. Right. Um, okay, that's slightly different because uh, the second amended stipulation, the wording in there, I had issue with in, return, in regards to the statement, no more than 20 of the jobs will be at PNM. Right, and, and my question to you is why, why do you propose this modification? Oh, uh, the, the statement in the, in the stipulation, uh, when you say no more than 20, um, it could also be as low as one or two jobs, as, as was admitted by one of the company witnesses last week. So there is no guarantee that the other jobs would be a direct product of the proposed transaction and may be created as a result of um, the Energy Transition Act, regardless of whether or not this merger is approved. Okay. Um, and, and my other question to you is, what about the language related to prioritizing the displaced folks at San Juan Generating Station? Um, do you agree with that language? Or in your proposed modification, do you, do you uh, recommend leaving that language out? Are you talking about 
uh, I'm just, again, I'm back to the stipulation. Right. Um, and was it, and we'll prioritize hiring personnel that have been, will be. Now, in my testimony, do you see anything that would contradict that second half of that statement? No, I'm just wondering, it's, not, it's not what's in there. So, I mean, do, do you still agree with leaving that language in? Well, I'd have to take it back to the elected officials of Bernalillo County. Um, uh, the The, it, it, it seems that um, that statement in and of itself has a noble goal. Um, I believe that the citizens, um, well, the jobs being displaced as a result of um, the closure of San Juan uh, you know, should be in included in these initiatives one way or another. Um, it just makes good economic sense. But again, um, I think the reason why I didn't address it in great detail in my testimony is because it, it just seemed um, so vague and nebulous. I couldn't really incorporate it in um, my net benefit analysis. Okay, no, nothing further, Mr. Herring Examiner. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Haverly, uh, you reserve 20 minutes. Yes, Mr. Hearing Examiner, uh, I have no questions for this witness. Okay. <clears throat> Mr. Alvidrez, you reserved uh, 30 minutes. Uh, yes, Mr. Uh, Hearing Examiner, uh, based on the uh, rebuttal <coughs> testimony of this witness, uh, we have no questions. Okay. Um, okay, I have no questions. Uh, Mr. Albright, is there any redirect? Uh, yes, Your Honor, I do have a little bit of uh, redirect here. Go ahead. And Ms. Reno, to go back to questions that you were asked by uh, Ms. Beatles and also by uh, Ms. Uh, Jur, the, uh, back to the paragraphs of 43 carbon reduction task force. And now I'm, I'm speaking of the, uh, of the stipulation. I'm at the second stipulation. And 44 and 49. Can you get there, please? I am there. Okay. And in paragraph uh, 43, uh, Ms. Beatles in particular uh, talked about the, um, try to find the, It uh, is fairly far down on 43, but it says, in addition, PNM will work with stakeholders to craft reasonable, appropriate New Mexico legislation in 2022 that would create a market-based credit program to achieve reasonable and consistent progress in reducing emissions to meet the ETA's 2045 decarbonization requirements. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Okay, it then follows and says the signatories reserve all positions on such legislation. Do you see that? Yes. And so that's not whether the parties do or don't include the term parties does include or doesn't include Bernalillo County 
that specific reference there limits it to signatories, correct? Yes. And that's part of the concern that, that you've expressed uh, when you were responding to the answers, correct? Yes, yeah, so uh, the, the best way to summarize it is that I'm concerned with the entirety of those two paragraphs, um, not just um, the legislative aspects, which um, we, I, I recall discussing in great detail. I believe that both those paragraphs um, and uh, I think it was 45 um, should be removed from the stipulation, uh, the second amended stipulation that is. These subjects are more appropriate for a rulemaking or legislation which are estab established processes that e and evolve consultation and output by public and relevant stakeholders. So in my opinion, what I'm saying is that it is not appropriate to include these paragraphs in a merger stipulation because it deprives the public and relevant stakeholders of the opportunity to provide input and review these proposed processes, rules, and outcomes. Is it your understanding that these provisions, um, now let me, re, let me ask, ask it another way. Um, in reviewing the second stipulation, are, are you aware or did you have the opportunity to look or address this language before it showed up in the second amended stipulation? No, I did not. As a result, I couldn't advise Bernalillo County on uh, whether they made um, good, whether they would contribute or negate the net financial benefits that we were discussing elsewhere, um, like such as the rate credits and all the other um, tangible financial benefits that we would include. I, so I, I, I was not a party to these negotiations, so I couldn't advise my client. And, and if parties does include, if the term parties in some of the other paragraphs does include Bernalillo County, um, it certainly would not include other IOUs who are not party to this proceeding, correct? That's correct. And that goes back to my point earlier saying that as a result of leaving out not only the non-signatories in this proceeding, um, but other interested stakeholders throughout New Mexico, um, other IOUs, um, other consumer advocacy groups or um, independent generators, anyone else who would be interested in um, the ramifications of setting up these um, environmental initiatives would be left out of the discussions and uh, would, be, would not be able to represent their interests in a fair manner. And if it were implemented, if the carbon reduction task force were implemented and they followed through with proposed legislation, whether or not Bernalillo County participated, it would affect all consumers and all IOUs throughout the state, correct? Uh, yes, that's correct. And so is that the basis for your um, proposal that a rulemaking would be a much better place to have it than in a stipulation, in, in this stipulation? Yes, because um, uh, having it in this stipulation is creating, um, particularly where the task force and the processes would be paid for by ratepayers, um, it, it would exclude and not allow the open public discourse and dialogue um, that would be available to the public and, re and relevant stakeholders. I'm, I'd also like to add too, um, that the task force and the processes may lead to policies and outcomes that may impose additional significant costs to ratepayers without the input um, or agreement of any of the non-signatories um, entities not even represented in this proceeding 
and having it included in the stipulation, uh, you know, where we know that the cost could be levied onto ratepayers, um, essentially would could negate any net benefits, net financial benefits that we've already identified that would be the product of this proceeding. Okay. All right, I want to turn attention to just uh, one other area, uh, just briefly with regard to uh, the RTO uh, questions that you were asked early on, again, by Ms. Beatles. Um, do you have experience with regard to RTOs uh, in other utility matters you've been involved in? Uh, yes, I do. Um, I have 20 years of experience. Uh, the first decade being uh, I served as a utility analyst at the New Hampshire Public Utilities Commission. Uh, and during that time when we were setting up um, our renewable portfolio standard program, and also participation in the regional greenhouse gas initiative. I was involved in uh, a few committees uh, that were run and operated by and organized by the New England ISO. Uh, and also uh, I've been involved recently in advising the state of Maryland on their renewable portfolio standard program and how participation and, and meeting the goals of that portfolio program could be impacted by changes made at uh, PJM. Okay. Which is another, which is another ISO in, in the Northeast. And so I do have experience uh, I, I, and in those, um, uh, when I, I worked on those initiatives, um, it, it, it's, it's clear that there are multiple stakeholders and interests that need to be incorporated, involved in the, in the planning process um, and vetted. So it, it, it was never the case where you would have, say, uh, one IOU, um, investor-owned utility, um, establishing and then organizing and developing um, an RTO-like system. Um, I know that there are some technical differences between RTOs and ISOs, um, but the process would essentially be the same where it would be a very public facing process where all relevant stakeholders um, would be involved in um, establishing and and then the day-to-day -day running and management of the organization. So putting it in the hands only of, so putting it under the auspices or the um, under PNM only would would that, in your opinion, ignore the involvement or perhaps uh, uh, circumvent the involvement of other IOUs or other uh, people who might have an interest in the organization and the setup, such as El Paso Electric or SPS or other, other IOUs within New Mexico? Well, to me, that's how the second amended stipulation proposes that be the case. Um, a specific language that states that PNM would lead the development of the RTO. Uh, that's why I proposed in my testimony that the commission or a neutral organization designated by the commission lead the development of an RTO. If PNM were to lead the development, I'm concerned that PNM would skew the process. So the RTO consists only of PNM as dominated by PNM or is skewed in favor of PNM's interests over uh, the public interests. Okay, thank you, Ms. Reno. Uh, Mr. Hearing Center, I have no more redirect uh, for Ms. Reno. Okay, uh, <clears throat> thank you, Ms. Reno. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, You're welcome. Your thank you. You're welcome. 
let's move to the community groups. Um, Ms. Beasley, I think you have uh, Carol Davis as a witness. Yes, yes, Mr. Hearing Examiner. Um, community groups would like to call Carol Davis. And Mr. Lee, could you swear her in? Would you please raise your right hand? You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give in the matter not pending to be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, yeah. hey, Ms. Beasley, go ahead. Yes. Um, uh, could you please state and spell your first and last name for the record? My name is Carol Davis, C A R O L. D-A-V-I-S. Thank you. And for whom are you employed? The Nest Citizens Against Ruining Our Environment. And on whose behalf are you testifying today? I am testifying on behalf of the Nest Citizens Against Ruining Our Environment, Diné Care, Native American Voters Alliance Education Project, otherwise known as NAVA EP, Tuanijona Anne, also known as TNA, and San Juan Citizens Alliance together known as the community groups. Okay. And do you have before you what is identified as community exhibit 11? Yes, I do. And this is your testimony filed June 18th, 2021 in this case, correct? I'm sorry, June 18th? Yes. Is that correct? Yes, yes, correct. And do you have any changes or corrections to make to this testimony? No, I do not. And if I asked you the same questions today, would your answers be the same? Yes. And these answers are true and correct to the best of your knowledge? Yes, they are true and correct to the best of my knowledge. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Hearing Examiner, on behalf of community groups, I move for Community Exhibit 11 to be admitted into the record. Any objection? Community Group Exhibit 11 is admitted. Thank you. I pass the witness for cross-examination. Okay, uh, Mr. Albright, you reserved five minutes. Uh, yes, Your Honor, I did. Well, good afternoon, uh, Ms. Davis. Good afternoon. I'm Jeff Albright from uh, J. Albright Law, LLC, and I represent Bernalillo County in this proceeding. Um, just two preliminary statements I'd like to make. One is I saw the passing of your as uh, president, had the opportunity to meet with uh, him um, on uh, one occasion. And uh, as a fellow uh, Vietnam uh, veteran, I uh, uh, certainly hold him and the other uh, uh, Navajo uh, folks in, in high esteem. And I appreciate, uh, wanted to, to know that that uh, uh, was not lost on us when we, when we saw the announcement of his passing. So wanted to pass that along. Uh, second of all, I wanted to make clear that Bernalillo County has no objection to the um, to the assistance that's being provided to your area under the proposed stipulation. But I did want to get a few, a couple of uh, things on the record here. Uh, you are not served or within PNM service territory. Is that correct? That is correct. But nonetheless, the the contributions being made by shareholders here will certainly uh, help your, your area, correct? That is correct. I also wanted to, um, to ask if you were familiar with Ms. Reno's testimony with regard to the increased uh, benefits um, that Bernalillo County has proposed I understand she has that request, but I'm not familiar with the details of her testimony. Okay, that's fair enough. Would you, do you have any, does, do you and uh, the people have any objection to additional uh, rate credits uh, being uh, included in the overall rate relief for, for consumers and customers of PNM? No, I, I do not oppose any commitments to relief. Okay. Although you aren't affected um, by a potential rate freeze, do you have a position as to whether or not a temporary rate freeze um, 
would be acceptable or not acceptable, or do you not have a position on that? I don't have a position because our focus is predominantly on the impacted communities in the Four Corners area. And as you stated yourself, they are not rate payers. Sure, okay. Uh, do you have any objection with regard to additional, and I wanna emphasize additional economic development um, funds that might be available or might be provided to the greater Bernalillo County metropolitan area or other areas within PM service territory? No opposition. And what is your view with, do you have a position with respect to, with respect to the, um, the agreement that's been reached with regard to the Four Corners uh, power plant? Could you rephrase that? Sure. In particular? Um, do you, uh, do you have a position with respect to the abandonment that's being proposed by PNM and the contract for NTEC continuing to operate the plant. Um, yes, we do not really support Intech taking over. That's very clear. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Schonauer. I have no further questions for Ms. Davis. Ms. Davis, thank you very much for taking the time and sorry I'm, uh, I've been responsible for your having to, to take, uh, take time off to be with us today, but thank you for your testimony, appreciate that. You're welcome, thank you for the opportunity. Ms. Beasley, do you have any redirect? No, Mr. Hanging member. Okay, uh, thank you, Ms. Davis. Uh, thank you for, for being here and for your testimony. You're excused. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're going to move on now to uh, NM area. Uh, Mr. Gould, uh, are you there? I, believe I am here, and I understand that Mr. Gorman, uh, we texted him about 10 minutes ago and told yeah. him to ask for admission. I, I believe I have been admitted. Okay. Good to see you, Mike. Yeah, nice to see you. I was worried there for a minute. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Would you raise your right hand, please? You saw much for the testimony you're about to give the matter of opinion. Should be the truth, all truth, nothing but the truth. I do. Uh, Mr. Gorman, would you state your full name and your business address for the record? My name is Michael Gorman. My business address is 16690 Swingley Ridge Road, Chesterfield, Missouri. Sorry, the address again, 16? 16... 16690 Swingley Ridge Road, Chesterfield, Missouri. And whom are you employed by and in what position? Employed by Brubaker and Associates as a managing principal. We are regulatory and economic consultants. And uh, the purpose of my next few questions will be to go through uh, testimony that you have filed, pre filed on behalf of uh, the New Mexico Affordable Reliable Energy Alliance. And um, I will just do this one cautionary note. We found that um, in reading into the record, a lot of the witnesses have been going rapidly and that creates a problem for Mr. Lee to record. So if you're asked to read your testimony or read another um, passage into the record, if you could just do it slowly so that Mr. Lee can get it down accurately. Is that is that uh, understood? It is, yes. Um, Mr. Gorman, do you have in front of you the direct testimony and exhibits of Michael P. Gorman filed on behalf of New Mexico Affordable Reliable Energy Alliance on April 2nd, 2021, and marked as NMRA Exhibit 1 in this yes, matter. I do. 
if you were asked uh, these same questions today, would your answers be the same? They would. And are those answers true and correct to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes. Mr. Hearing Examiner, I would move for the, admit, uh, the admission of NM Area Exhibit 1. Is there any objection? NM Area Exhibit 1 is admitted. And Mr. Gorman, would you turn to the next document that's in front of you, which is entitled Rebuttal Testimony of Michael P. Gorman on behalf of New Mexico Affordable Reliable Energy Alliance and filed in this matter on April 21, 2021 and marked for identification as NM area number three. Do you see that? I do. If you were asked these same questions today, would your answers be the same? They would. And are those answers true and correct to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes. Mr. Hang examiner, I would move for the admission of NM area exhibit number three. Any objections? NM area exhibit number three is admitted. And finally, Mr. Gorman, do you have in front of you a document that's entitled Testimony of Michael P. Gorman in opposition to second amended stipulation filed in this matter on July 16th, 2021 and marked for identification as NM area exhibit number four? I do. And if you were asked these same questions today, would your answers be the same? Yes. And are those answers true and correct to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes. Mr. Hearing Examiner, I would ask for the admission of NM Area Exhibit 4 into the record. Any objection? Hearing none, uh, NM Area Exhibit 4 is admitted. And with that, I pass the witness for cross-examination. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we still have listed here uh, 10 minutes for the uh, Water Authority. Okay. Uh, the Water Authority has no questions of this witness. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Albright, you've reserved uh, 15 minutes. Uh, yes, Mr. Uh, Schoenauer. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Uh, Gorman. Good afternoon. Uh, Jeff Albright, uh, J. Albright Law LLC, and I uh, represent Bernalillo County. Um, I want to focus on, I believe it's your exhibit number for the uh, opposition uh, to the stipulation that was uh, filed July 16, 2021. Okay. Okay, and uh, since my time is short, I'd like to, I wanna start uh, off at page 26, please, where we talk about the uh, restriction on dividends distributions related to paragraph 28. Okay. And you've proposed some language there that you're suggesting be incorporated into the stipulation or some kind of a final uh, disposition by the commission. Exact, exactly how do you see that working in this proceeding? Uh, and by that, let me, let me just clarify the question a little bit. Um, we have before the commission a second amended stipulation. How do you see this language getting incorporated into the final decision by the, uh, by the commission, by the PRC commission? Well, we, we are opposing the second amended stipulation as written. So with these adjustments to a, a stipulation that outlines the terms and commitments for, for Avant Grid's proposed acquisition of PNL, um, PNM area would consider no longer opposing this, this transaction. So whatever the ultimate legal document is that uh, mem memorializes Avangrid's commitment to uh, operations and financing of PNM in a way that meets the public interest uh, is what we're anticipating. Um, there might be legal 
aspects of that to which I'm not testifying, but, but ultimately the, the intent is for commitments by Avangrid for the operation of PNM and the financing of PNM uh, to be in line with what we believe is appropriate to protect the public interest. Okay. And with the language that you have on 26 with regard to the bond rating, um, and I'm just going to read the first sentence in the record to make sure I have it right. Has joint applicants commit that, and this is your proposed language here, correct? Yes. Okay. Joint applicants commit the PNM will not pay dividends or distributions except for contractual tax payments at any time the PNM's debt rating is below BBB or its equivalent with any of the credit rating with any of the credit rating agencies unless approved by the commission in a proceeding open for that purpose. Okay. <clears throat> have I quoted that correctly? You have. All right, we have the way it reads to me in a question is PNM's debt rating is below BBB and um, is that with or without a negative watch on the triple B rating? Well, the, the PNM could maintain its triple B rating with a negative watch. However, it would fall below the triple B rating if at any time it's credit rating was downgraded to triple B minus by Standard & Poor's or Moody's or BAA3 by Moody's. At that point, they would not be in compliance with this dividend restriction and they would be prohibited from paying a dividend without explicit permission from the commission. Is it normal practice for the rating agencies to go from triple B to triple B minus without having first been put on a negative watch? Yeah, the rating agencies typically will provide warnings to the utility and investors of a potential upgrade or downgrade in the bond rating. A negative outlet suggests that credit rating agencies are contemplating a downgrade. Um, that gives the utility an opportunity to respond to the credit rating agency's concerns. Um, so the, the dividend restriction would occur after the triple B bond rating was lost uh, and a triple B minus bond rating was implemented or a BAA bond rating by Moody's. So my understanding is you could have a triple B rating with a negative watch, hasn't yet gone to triple B minus, but you could have triple B with a negative watch and there would be no requirement to report that negative watch to the Public Regulation Commission. Is that correct? Well, there would be no restriction on the dividend payment. The utility would have an opportunity to respond to the negative watch outlook uh, to uh, restore its credit standing, maintain a stable outlook. Um, but its requirement to inform the regulatory commission of that negative outlook is not contemplated in this paragraph. Is that something that you think should be added? <clears throat> uh, it's, it's an informational point that uh, the utility can provide to the to the commission. It will be a matter of public record uh, when they are placed on negative watch. But not uh, a re I'm sorry, didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah, I've not, I've not made that a, a proposed requirement in this paragraph because it is a matter of public record. And dividends would still be at the discretion of the board as it's uh, been structured with three of seven independent directors, correct? It would, yes. Uh, as long as they maintain the triple B bond rating. And when you say triple B, you're talking triple B, not triple B minus. Yeah, triple B minus would not be in compliance with this paragraph and there would be a dividend restriction without approval from the commission. Okay, thank you.
I had a question as well related to um, the New York uh, with regard to the board and the makeup and specifically with uh, the New York Stock Exchange Rule uh, 303. Uh, there is a provision in the New York Stock Exchange that allows for a company that is majority owned by another company or affiliate to get an exception with the New York Stock Exchange uh, with regard to the uh, independent uh, directors. Are you aware of that provision? And not in great detail, but I know there are exceptions to it, yes. Okay. Do you know if the exception is requested, whether or not it's automatically granted, or would it still be subject to a condition that could be put on, that could be placed on that by the Public Regulation Commission, for example? Um, I have not looked at this from the standpoint of New York Stock Exchange regulatory oversight. Rather, I'm looking at this from a standpoint of New Mexico okay. regulatory oversight. And from that standpoint, we're concerned about independent board directors' ability to restrict dividend payments in the event the utility needs the equity capital. Um, so I, I can't speak specifically for those exceptions for, for the New York New York Stock Exchange, but but the intent is to ensure that there are board members that are independent, that have no financial interest in the parent company or the subsidiary uh, that can um, work without, ec without economic uh, conflicts of interest and in ensuring that the utility is operated in a manner to meet the public interest for what it for what it is chartered to operate. You also turn back to page twenty. I'm sorry, to page seven, please. Again, same uh, same testimony. <clears throat> Mr. Hearing Examiner, how much more time do I have? You have five minutes. Okay. Thank you, sir. And are you at page seven, Mr. Gorman? I am, yes. Okay. Uh, you, there's a question there at line six. Can you discuss the development of the various stipulations being filed in this case? Uh, do you see that? I do. And I just would like you to read that, but not into the record, just, just to refresh your memory here a little bit. I have read it. Okay, you're a much quicker reader than I am for sure. Um, but my, uh, my question is, with all of those iterations of the stipulation that have gone on, the first stipulation, the initial stipulation, second and amended filed, then the third, second amended stipulation filed June 4th, 2021. Do you have an opinion with regard to what I will refer to as piecemeal stipulation uh, making as to how difficult that is for public elected officials to get a grasp on what's happening with respect to this stipulation. Mr. Hearing Examiner, I'm going to object to this as friendly. I'm Gorman. sorry, who's speaking? I'm sorry, Mr. Lee. This is Stephen Michael with WRA. Go ahead. With your objection. Oh, yes, I'm objecting to friendly cross. Right. Well, this isn't friendly cross. I'm trying to figure out how, how all of these changes with regard to ABCWA, with regard to those being proposed by Bernalillo County, with those that are obviously part and parcel of uh, this testimony by Mr. Gordon, where extensive time and energy and effort has been in 
to modify the language, which we don't know if going is going to be accepted or not by the commission or how it's going to be incorporated that we can't even uh, address with uh, through the elected officials. And I just want to know if Mr. Gorman has an opinion on that or, or how this is going to work. Okay, overruled, go ahead. Well, I, I cannot speak to the resources the elected officials have available to them to track the, 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 the positions of the parties in this case. I would note that the concerns we have with the proposed acquisition have been identified up front and, and advocated for throughout this entire process. Um, so the, the stipulations have, have changed and we have eliminated some issues, not all of them yet, uh, but we have resolved some differences throughout this proceeding. Um, but the differences largely were related to issues that were identified up front. Uh, so I think the, the evolution throughout this case um, relates more to the parties coming together to find compromises rather than to identify new concepts that need to be resolved within the case. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gorman, I appreciate that. Um, Mr. Schonauer, uh, I have no further questions for Mr. Gorman. And uh, Mr. Gorman, I wanna thank you very much for uh, both your time and your, uh, your uh, diligent effort here in, your, uh, um, in the filed testimony that you made on, the, on June 16th. So thank you very much, appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, next up is uh, WRA. Uh, Mr. Michael, I assume you're doing the cross here? Yes, Mr. Shadower. Okay, you've reserved, uh, let me see, 25 minutes. Yes. Go ahead. Good afternoon, Mr. Gorman. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Steve Michael. I'm with Western Resource Advocates. Um, on page two of your June 18th testimony, or was it June 18th of your NM area exhibit uh, four, July 16th, I'm sorry, NM area exhibit four. Um, you discuss um, some discussions that were had and, and some consensus positions um, in the Q&A at the top of that page. Um, were you involved in those discussions that you're referencing where at least apparently some understandings were reached? I was uh, involved in some of the negotiations with the other parties and I was involved in um, meetings with NM area's attorneys to advise them on the meaning um, and, and differences between parties' positions with respect to these issues? Yeah, I'm just referring to not, not your discussions with, with your client, but um, discussions with other parties. Uh, which other parties uh, were you involved in discussions with in this most recent uh, development of, of um, potential commitments? You know, I, I certainly with uh, PNM and Abingrid, okay, and uh, NM areas lawyers. You know, I, I was asked to advise them in many occasions throughout this process. Okay, I don't, but, recall, but... I don't recall being involved in meetings with other stakeholder parties. Okay, or other other signatories to the stipulation. You're correct. Okay. I, I can't say that for certain, but as I sit here, I don't recall that. Okay, you were not involved in any discussions with WRA, right? Did I don't recall, recall being, I, I think that's correct, yes. Okay. And you have um, identified a number of provisions that you would like to see changed in the uh, second amended stipulation in your 
part of your testimony, right? That's correct. And um, some of them, um, I believe, have been accepted by the joint applicants as um, things that they would be willing to commit to. Is that right? I think many of them have, have uh, the joint applicants have noted that they're willing to agree to. And if the ones that remain in dispute are not accepted or uh, required by the commission, uh, would NM area then, would NM area's position then be that it would oppose the merger altogether and prefer the status quo? Um, objection. I, I have no objection to the general direction of the question. I'm just a little confused, Steve. Could you break it down and maybe restate it? Uh, th just a formal, formal question objection. But I've got. I'll, I'll try again. Mr. Where you're going? Thank you. Um, so, Mr. Gorman, if the provisions that have not been accepted by the joint applicants are likewise not accepted by the commission as part of a final order in this case, would NM areas position then be that the merger should be disapproved and, and the status quo preserved? Well, if there's a series of changes to the second amended stipulation, then NM area would take that into consideration. I can't speak for them on whether or not they would reject it if all of these conditions were not accepted. By, by the joint applicants and the signatories to the stipulation. Um, but I can tell you that NM area is not willing to accept the second amended stipulation without, without these modifications. And so if these modifications are not made, NM area would prefer the status quo? I, I can't go that far with it because if certain modifications to the second amended stipulation were made, uh, we would have to know the status of what components were not they were not modified and and, and evaluate that you know, the determination on whether or not uh, you know how, how would would respond to that okay um could you turn to page 14 of your uh again your um july 16th testimony in there and at the top of that page, you recommend that the rate credits be allocated the same way that they were, that um, presumably something was allocated in PM's last general rate case. Um, let me begin by is it, is it your understanding that? Um, the joint applicants have agreed to increase the rate credits to $65 million contingent on um, the non-opposition of the Water Utility Authority. Are you familiar with that? I'm sorry, would you repeat that question, please? Yes, are you aware that the joint applicants have agreed to increase the rate credit um, contingent on the Water Utility Authority not opposing uh, the transaction. If, if not, I'd like you to just accept that, if you will. I'll accept that, but I'm, I guess I'm a little confused as to whether or not you're, you're suggesting that is part of my proposed no, I'm not. I'm not. I'm just, you referenced the rate credit, and I'm trying to establish what that amount is that you're referring to. Okay. Would you yeah. accept subject to check that that could be as much as $65 million as an outcome to this case? Yes. Okay. And um, I take it that you do not support a per customer allocation of these rate credits. In other words, an equal amount for each customer on PNM system or each customer account. 
Well, the, the appropriate cost should align with, with how the commission is. We're recommending it be, be done in a just and reasonable manner and align with how the commission did it and, uh, uh, yeah, cost of service principles in its next rate case. Um, so I don't, I don't know if I'm specifically advocating for, um, you know, the, the details which, which you're getting at here, but we are referencing the El Paso case is a case that, that would, should be used as a, a guideline for how an appropriate allocation of those annual rate credits uh, should be made across various rate classes. Well, I'm just trying to understand what you mean by the cost allocation methodology improved in PM's last general rate case. There are different allocation methods used for different types of costs. I'm sorry, I'm different allocation, different allocation methods used and you've trailed off. For different types of costs, and I'm trying to understand what you are recommending here. With the rate credit and how that is spread across the various rate classes in the El Paso rate case. Um, I'm not familiar with that. Was that um, usage per customer? Was that generally the allocation that was that you're recommending here? Uh, I mean, you referenced PM's case, not El Paso's case. So I'm trying to understand what what exactly you are recommending. And I'm not trying to catch you or anything. I'm just trying to understand what it is you're suggesting here. Well, we're, we're getting out a little. You know, we're referencing methodologies used to allocate the credits across various classes. Okay. Um, and generally, it, it probably should align more with you know, the actual financial and operating considerations for, for the proposed acquisitions. Um, and that, that would entail something more aligned with uh, rate-based investments and, and operating costs that uh, could be... Um, impacted by Avangrid's acquisition of U and M. Thank you. Okay. Would you support a uh, a per kilowatt hour allocator? Uh, Do you does your client support have, have the authority to, to speak on behalf of PNM or New Mexico area on uh, the proposed allocation, but it, uh, you know, I doubt they would oppose a kilowatt hour allocation, but they likely would want the opportunity to advocate for a rate class allocation that is fair to all rate classes and reasonably aligns with the risk and benefits of the proposed acquisition. Okay. Um, in your original testimony in this case, you indicate that you're representing and I'm area with um, special participation of Greater Kudu LLC. Um, Greater Kudu is is Facebook, right? It's a uh, yes. Okay. And um, would you agree that Facebook's load either is or is anticipated to be soon? Roughly a million megawatt hours per year. I can't confirm that. Uh, I did not specifically look at that for my testimony. Would that surprise you? Well, it is a significant load on the system, creating a lot of jobs to operate the center. So it wouldn't surprise me, but I cannot confirm it. Okay. You were you involved in one of the Facebook cases? I was uh, not. Before the commission, okay. Um, objection, Your Honor. Uh, we've allowed a couple of questions, but this is well beyond the scope of Mr. Gorman's testimony, so I object on those grounds. Well, yeah, Mr. Shanauer, my question's been answered, but um, so I don't know. Um, That's fine, then. Let's move okay. on. <laughs> um, uh, Mr. Gorman, would you agree, subject to check that PNM's annual load is roughly 10 million megawatt hours per year. Again, I didn't check that information in preparation of my testimony or to prepare for this hearing. 
Um, it wouldn't okay. surprise me. So no. Okay. Would you accept that subject to check? 10 million megawatt hours a year, you know, Roughly. retail sales? Yeah, yes. I, I can. Okay. And if that were the case then, and if there were a usage per customer allocator assigned to the six, $65 million and Facebook's load was roughly a 10th of that, Facebook would be receiving a rate credit of roughly six and a half million dollars. And I know there was- a, Mr. Hearings, I don't object to that. Uh, Mr. Michael is trying to introduce uh, evidence that is not on the record in this case concerning uh, Greater Kudu's load. Um, and Mr. Gorman has already stated it's outside the scope of his knowledge and his testimony. We'd object on both those grounds. Mr. Michael? I, I asked Mr. Gorman not to affirm Facebook's load, but to assume Facebook's load. Well, we would object to that because the, the result of the question is going to actually be a data point in, the, in, in this case that cannot be confirmed by the record in this case. So, and again, Mr. Mr. Gorman has stated this is beyond the scope of his testimony. If, if Mr. Michael wants to ask a PNM witness uh, those questions and they're competent and they have the knowledge to do it, that, that'd be fine. But this witness has stated that he doesn't know. So I think yeah, it's- I'm an sustaining, I'm sustaining the objection. Thank you. Could you turn to page 40 of your testimony, Mr. Gorman? Uh, Mr. Michael, uh, could we still on the July 16th testimony? Yes, yes, okay. I'll be on I'll be on that and in particular this page for the rest for the rest of my cross. Are you there? I am, yes. And on that page, at the bottom of the page, you take issue with use of the term um, preeminent importance with respect to the carbon reduction goals of paragraph 44. Do you see that? I do. Okay. Did you say preeminent employment? Preeminent importance. Um, would you agree that it's possible to have reliable electric service that is not affordable? That is a possibility, yes. Okay. And it's also possible to have affordable electric service that's not reliable. Is that right? That's true also. Okay. And would you agree that extreme weather events threaten both reliability and affordability of electricity service? or can threaten reliability and affordability? Extreme weather events can impact service reliability and, and the cost of providing service, yes. Okay. And the freezing weather we saw in Texas, I guess it was earlier this year, caused both disruptions of service and excessive costs, right? Objection. This is well beyond the scope of Mr. Gorman's testimony. He doesn't have a single word about weather events in his testimony. So we object on that grounds. Overruled. I was asking about the, the freezing event in Texas earlier this year and whether that caused disruptions in service and, and, um, and higher costs of service. In some That's cases, extremely higher costs. Yeah, the winter events in the Texas region did cause disruptions of service and had the effect of increasing wholesale gas and electricity prices in a significant way, yes. Okay, and similarly, wildfires in California caused service disruptions, destroyed facilities, and potentially significantly increased costs of serving customers as a result of that. They did, yes. Okay. And severe droughts, which curtail the availability of hydroelectricity in the West, can also have 
significant impacts on both reliability and affordability of electricity in our region. Would you agree with that? It can, uh, to, it has in the Pacific Northwest, but mm -hmm. to the extent there are adequate uh, generating resources uh, to back up the hydro facilities that, that may uh, curtail negative impacts on reliability. Okay. But it would um, result in substantially higher costs or could. It could, yes. Hydro is a lot cheaper than a lot of other facility, a lot of other forms of generation, right? I missed the first part of that question. Hydro power is often quite a bit less expensive than other forms of electricity. Well, I, I would put it this way. If you're already paying the fixed cost of hydro, it's very low cost to operate it. Right. And to the extent you're paying the fixed cost and don't get the benefit of the energy output, then it, it will cost likely cost more money to replace that energy output if, uh, if there is restrictions on the amount of energy generation. Okay. And are you aware that droughts, wildfires, extreme weather events are all consequences of climate change? That's my understanding, yes. Okay. And that climate change is caused from the emission of greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide from power plants? That Mr. Is. Examiner, I'm going to object that Mr. Gorman has not been retained as a climate expert, and we're getting into an area that is well beyond his, uh, his testimony, the scope of his testimony. I'm Mr. Karen Examiner, I'm asking him to accept what has already been part of the record and accept it as established facts in this record. But Mr. Overruled. Michael, if you could point... Overruled. Let's okay, go. sorry about that. Mr. Gorman, I asked you if um, principal cause of climate change is the emission of greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide from power plants. I, I, the, what I'm pausing about is you said principal cause. I know it is a cause, but I, I'm not in a position to characterize it as the principal cause. But I do know it is a, a significant factor in and uh, human uh, activity that, that is contributing to uh, climate change. Okay. You have four minutes, uh, Mr. Michael. Thank you, Mr. Hearing Examiner. So would you agree that if our climate keeps changing with increased extreme weather events, wildfires, droughts, ice storms, that will impair the ability to protect and preserve or to preserve affordable and reliable electricity service. Isn't that right? I think that is a significant change in integrated resource planning done in electric and gas utilities currently to recognize the potential change for environmental impacts on service territories and the need to uh, modify infrastructure investments and resource options uh, to economically re operate through those changed environmental conditions. Let me ask it this way. Would you agree that it, it is much more difficult, if not impossible, to preserve reliable, affordable electricity service if we have continually increasing severe weather events, droughts, wildfires, ice storms of the like we've started to see over the last couple of years? That, that I believe is a significant factor in planning for economic and reliable utility systems currently. So, yes. so one key component of, of protecting reliable and affordable service would be to try and um, mitigate the effects of climate change. Would you agree with that? That is part of the integrated resource planning is meeting carbon reduction goals and, and enhancing infrastructure strength and hardening investments 
to allow for continued operation through more difficult and constrained uh, weather conditions and, and other environmental factors. Yes. And, and if you can avoid some of those environmental factors in the first place by not exacerbating the climate disruptions that we're already witnessing, that would help um, alleviate reliability and affordability issues. Would you agree? Well, if they weren't factors, then I would agree, but they are factors now. So part of the planning is to recognize the changed environmental impacts on system reliability and safety um, and to economically plan to provide utility service in a reliable manner with those additional constraints. And to also do our best to keep those factors from getting worse, right? That would also be part of the planning process, yes. Okay, thank you. That's all I have, Mr. Gorman. Thank you. Okay, uh, CCAE, uh, you've reserved 20 minutes. Okay, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Gorman. Good afternoon. I'm Stephanie Zur, and I represent the Coalition for Clean Affordable Energy. Nice to meet you. I am going to ask you about a statement in your testimony, but I'm not going to ask you to pull it up because it is just um, one sentence. So I'm going to read it to you and ask my question. Uh, what amendments is NM area proposing for paragraph 43 carbon task force of the second amended stipulation? NM area has two issues with this commitment. First, the intent and scope of the carbon reduction task force is not clear to NM area. So um, with that, with regard to that testimony that NM area does not understand the intent and scope of the carbon reduction task force, could you please open JA exhibit two, which is the second amended stipulation and um, excuse me, before you go on, could we make it clear exactly where you're reading from Mr. Gorman's July 16th testimony? Is it page 39? Yes. Line uh, starting on line eight down to line 14? To line 12. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I was reading along with you. Let me know when you have JA exhibit two available to you. I have it open. Okay, thank you. And I'm on page 21. So, um, I'm sorry, is that page 21 with J exhibit two or the document? It is page 21 of the stipulation, which is on the PDF page 33 of 45. Thank you. Let me know when you're there. I'm there. Okay, do you see Carbon Reduction Task Force number 43? I do. Okay, so NM area doesn't understand the intent and scope. So I would point you to um, where, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, the sixth line, it says, to ensure that PNM will not only meet but exceed its zero carbon goals, by achieving net zero emissions by or before 2040 and if feasible and otherwise in the public interest 2035, right? I'm just asking you, did you read that? It says that and I'm not, I haven't asked a question yet. Just I'm having you confirm you've read that with me, right? I read that, yes. Okay, and then over starting on the last line of page 21, it, uh, after the parenthetical, it says the joint applicants will cause PNM to present a workable step-by-step -step plan to exceed its carbon reduction goals plan to the PNM Carbon Reduction Task Force. I'm sorry, to exceed its carbon reduction goals. Parentheses, quotation, plan, unquote, on parentheses, 
to the carbon to the PNM Carbon Reduction Task Force. And um, in addition, it provides in the next sentence, the Carbon Reduction Task Force will provide comments and suggestions to PNM and PNM with respect to its plan and joint applicants will cause PNM to address each and every comment, right? It does say that, yes. Okay, and I don't know if I already asked you this. It talks about um, leveraging opportunities for outside funding and to have someone whose job it is to seek third party funding opportunities to achieve uh, carbon reduction goals, right? That's in there too? It is, yes. Okay, would you agree that establishes the intent and scope of the carbon reduction task force? It doesn't really describe how the carbon reduction task force will impact PM's resource planning, um, which is an integral part of the effort to reduce carbon. And the stipulation also at page 53 outlines certain commitments of continued integrated resource planning on behalf of PM. So what's not clear to me is how this paragraph interacts or contradicts the system resource planning commitments outlined in paragraph 53. So my, my confusion is whether or not the carbon task force will follow the, the resource planning uh, priority list and economic selection of resource opportunities for PM, or whether or not the task force will provide constraints on the planning process to identify the best and least cost means of achieving the resource planning objectives of high quality, reliable service at reasonable cost and achieving the carbon reduction. So it's, it's the interaction of those two paragraphs and the understanding that PNM, based on this agreement is, is committing to be a competitive supplier of electric utility service. Is there any reason that PNM actually um, creating a plan as contemplated with this paragraph it would necessarily conflict with the IRP process? I, I, I cannot say definitively because it's not clear to me that, that that's not, will not happen based on you know, the, the combination of these two paragraphs in the stipulation. Well, how come something that this doesn't say and something this doesn't require cause a conflict in the IRP? What part of this could conflict with the IRP other than PNM is going to develop a plan uh, to reduce its carbon? It doesn't require PNM to make this its IRP plan, does it? Well, if the intent is for PNM to be able to conduct uh, <clears throat> unconstrained resource planning to identify the best and lowest cost resource to meet the combined objectives of high quality reliable power while achieving carbon reduction, then, then I'm not sure that paragraph 43 is really needed. Um, so it's, 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 it's kind really of a, needed is needed. Um, because that my understanding is PNM has an objective to meet the stated goal of carbon reduction by 2040. And I, I'm not aware of any constraints why they wouldn't try to do it faster if it was economic and feasible to do that. Does PNM always do everything required by statute in what you would believe to be the most cost-effective way or the, the best way? Objection, form of the question, and ask the witness to speculate on matters outside the scope of his testimony. Overruled. I don't know if they would do that as a normal, as a, as a routine, normal practice, but if there's requirements to limit their ability to select the most economic resource plan that meets all of the objectives we've been describing, then that might cause them 
to seek plans that would otherwise be the, the best and lowest cost option that they would pursue. I'm gonna move on to another question, but also about paragraph 43. So you know the carbon reduction task force includes consumer interests. Um, and that's the beginning of paragraph 43, the fourth line, the uh, joint applicants will create a task force, force within one month following closing a proposed transaction to include stakeholder representatives of environmental interest, clean energy industry representatives, comma, consumer interests. So consumer interests would be represented in the carbon reduction task force, right? That's how paragraph 43 reads, yes. It, doesn't that offer uh, some protection that the interests of consumers and affordable energy would be considered by the task force? Well, in, in resource planning, considered is, is, is a concept that, that can be defined you know, as lowest and best resource option to achieve stated objectives. Uh, ratepayer interest is not so clearly defined. So it may be appropriate and may be covered through traditional resource planning objectives, but it's just not clear to me that it is. So you're aware that NMRA supported Facebook Greater Kudu's decarbonization goals in several dockets before the NNPRC? I'm sorry, that's just too quick. So you're aware that NMRA you you are aware that NM area supported Facebook slash Greater Kudus decarbonization goals in several dockets before the NMPRC. Objection, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Gorman has already stated that he's not aware and he didn't participate in the prior uh, Greater Kudu cases. Sustained. Uh, Mr. Hearing Examiner, I'm not asking him about the cases. He said he didn't participate, which indicates he's aware of the case. I'm just asking him if he's aware that NM area has supported voluntary renewable energy programs for large customers. I think he can answer that question. Go ahead and answer that question. I'm sorry. Could you repeat that question? Because I heard it a little differently when, when you just restated it. Are you aware that NM area has supported renewable energy programs for large customers? Well, I didn't confirm it for purposes of this hearing, but it would not surprise me if they would have done that. Okay, and um, are you aware that uh, PNM has a program called the Solar Direct Program that is entirely subscribed by large customers? Uh, they have not addressed that issue for PNM area, but it would not surprise me. Okay, so I'm gonna point to the Carbon Reduction Task Force. Um, Again, this, the provision that says that there will be um, stakeholder representatives, including consumer interests, to ensure that P, you know, PM will not only meet but exceed its zero carbon goals. So, would you agree with me that voluntary renewable programs may be one way in which uh, carbon reduction and um, customer desired programs can intersect? I would agree with that. And that, that I think is already ongoing, yes. And do you understand that the Carbon Reduction Task Force would offer an opportunity for consumers to make suggestions, for example, for voluntary renewable programs for residential customers that if they're not being served, they can make those recommendations to see if there is a way to achieve the dual goals of decarbonization and, uh, and um, volunteer, more voluntary renewable energy for customer programs, right? Objection to the form of a question, compound question. Same. 
So I guess what I'm getting at is do, could, you know, you don't know the intent or scope, but I'm asking is, isn't one of the things that could be achieved by the carbon reduction task force would be to explore opportunities for voluntary renewable programs that would also achieve carbon reduction. I think interaction between the utility and customers for those types of programs would be useful and a practical component that could be considered and should be evaluated by the utility within their planning process. And, and maybe customers who, not, who are not being served by voluntary renewable energy programs like large customers that NMRA has supported would have an opportunity to make those suggestions in the carbon reduction task force, right? That, that is a possibility within the task force or within other means for, for interactions between the utility and its customers. And would you agree that the uh, IRP process is not the place where a utility is going to be able to negotiate voluntary renewable programs to serve customers like residential customers that are not receiving access to voluntary renewable energy programs? Objection assumes evidence about the IRP program that's not in evidence in this case. Overruled. Well, there wouldn't be a negotiation for the utility, but there certainly could be an assessment of the economic merits and actual benefits produced through the program within the planning process. So there the wouldn't planning be process certainly has a place to ensure that the utility is meeting all of its objectives, including carbon reductions. You, what are you referring to? You said there wouldn't be a negotiation. Were you talking about the IRP process in your response that you just gave? Yeah, the IRP process would use the, the expected cost and the benefits of the program and assess whether or not, you know, what, what is the potential impact on the cost to customers as well as the benefits received by customers. But that wouldn't be a place to actually negotiate in, in uh, a program, right? You, well, just the negotiation, you would just evaluate. The negotiation could come before the planning process and just to determine whether or not the, the agreed upon resource um, meets you know, the economic assessment that, that would be made within the planning process. So um, isn't it true that PM is already achieving higher levels of decarbonization beyond minimum statutory requirements by adding voluntary renewable energy programs? You know, I'd have to confirm that, but I, I believe that is correct. And if they're just getting uh, individual programs confirmed, would you agree that's an ad hoc basis and not uh, an opportunity for everyone to participate? Would have, I have not made that evaluation yet, whether or not there have been programs considered for all rate classes or just limited number of rate classes. Mr. Hearing Examiner, could I ask you to take administrative notice of the fact that the p and Green Energy Tariff only serves one customer, a large customer, and the Solar Direct program only serves large customers and does not serve residential customers? Mr. Hearing Examiner, we have no objection to uh, administrative notice of, of the current green tariffs, uh, and we have no objection to the administrative notice of the voluntary programs that include the city of Albuquerque, which does serve residentials, and, and Bernalillo County, but we would object to uh, Mr. Zurer's characterization of those programs. I'll withdraw my characterization if you're uh, giving me administrative notice. So, um, Mr. And Hearing. We would also have not object to administrative notice of any of the greater kudu dockets that this commission has held and approved. And, um, and the actual order in the, in the voluntary solar program, the 50 megawatts that Bernalillo County and city of Albuquerque are participating in, we have no objection at all with that. Thank you. And I'll state for the, 
record too that CCAE was participant uh, a participant in those dockets and approved of those also. So um, no criticism intended by mentioning large customers participation in those uh, that uh, uh, as my questions have indicated and your answers have indicated those programs help decarbonization. So I'm just really getting at the fact that um, the carbon reduction task force would provide more opportunities for a crossover of decarbonization with more voluntary programs perhaps uh, that would expand to other interests besides the large customers. But um, Mr. Herring, Zetter, did you roll on the administrative notice? I didn't hear that. No, I don't understand what you're asking. Um, I was asking that uh, the commission take administrative notice of that fact that those uh, programs, the green energy tariff in the uh, Facebook uh, Greater Kudu docket is only open to one customer and that the Solar Direct program was only open to limited customers as well and not widely open to residential customers. Well, Mr. Hank Examiner, th that characterization we would, we would challenge because the, the green tariff does not limit, um, limit itself to one customer. Any customer that meets the, the or, or can meet uh, the, the requirements of that rate can apply. Um, it does have very uh, specific requirements, but it doesn't limit it to one customer. Uh, currently only one customer has applied. And with respect to the voluntary programs, city of, of Albuquerque and Bernalillo County participated in those um, on, on behalf of their, of their residents. So, but what I think would be a cleaner way to do this, if Ms. Zura wants to go and cite to the actual uh, commission decisions with the with the numbers of the cases, we have no problem with the commission taking notice of that case of those cases. I don't have those numbers in front of me, but um, no, this is not the kind of thing I'm going to take administrative notice of. I mean, this is. Uh, uh, Mr. Hearing Examiner, I can withdraw my request. It's not important. I think we just made a full record on what I was trying to get administrative notice of anyway. So with that, I'd like to end my cross-examination. And thank you, Mr. Gorman. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. We're going to take a 15-minute break now, 15-minute uh, uh, recess until uh, 3.21.
Okay, uh, are we ready to uh, resume here? Get a drink of water, hold on. Babe, could you fill this up? Go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you, David. Um, Mr. Lesky, you're up next. You reserved five minutes. No questions, Mr. Hearing Examiner. Okay. Mr. Haverly, you reserved 20 minutes. Yes, thank you, Mr. Hearing Examiner. I only have a couple of questions. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Gorman, real quickly, uh, do you understand that PM, the utility company, does not have any independent board members currently? That is correct, yes. And Mr. Gor Mr. Gorman, do you understand that the NYSE guidelines only apply to those companies that are publicly traded? Yeah, that, that would, yes, that's correct. Mr. Gorman, do you know if there's an exception on the NYSE rules for independent directors for controlled companies that are owned 50% or more by a single shareholder? I do not know that as I sit here. Okay. Mr. Hanzano, I actually have no other questions than that. Okay. All right, well, let's move to uh, Mr. Alvidras. Uh, Mr. Alvidras, you reserve 20 minutes also. Yes, thank you, Mr. Examiner. Good afternoon, Mr. Gorman, how are you? Good afternoon, I'm fine, thank you. Uh, in your testimony dated July 16, uh, you recounted that there have been some discussions uh, among representatives of M NM area and the joint applicants with regard to trying to narrow uh, the areas of controversy uh, between those parties. Is that, is that a correct understanding? It is. And you indicated that um, your testimony includes uh, certain specific provisions which you believe if they are uh, agreed to and ultimately adopted would uh, render the uh, second amendment stipulation in the public interest. Is that uh, a fair understanding over all of your testimony? It is, yes. And the joint applicants submitted uh, rebuttal testimony that addressed uh, each of your recommendations. Is that correct? Yes. And have you had a chance to review those rebuttal testimonies that responded to your recommendations? I have, yes. And was there sufficient agreement uh, expressed in those uh, rebuttal testimonies filed by the joint applicant witnesses such that New Mexico area is uh, at least not opposed to uh, the proposed merger uh, if the uh, terms as reflected in the joint applicant's uh, rebuttal testimony are made part of a final order? as a condition approval. I believe there are still some separations between NM area and the joint applicants, but the majority of the issues have been resolved based on, you know, if, if the joint applicants rebuttal testimony amendments are accepted by the commission. Okay. And am I correct that uh, NM area does not oppose the uh, proposed merger transaction between 
uh, DNM resources at Avon Grid. Uh, if, if our revisions to the second amended stipulation are part of the commission approval, um, it would be, it's my understanding that NM area will not oppose the transaction. Thank you very much. Those are my questions, Mr. Examiner. Okay, thank you. Um, um, Mr. Hearing Examiner, I wonder if I could just make, this is Peter Gould, make a statement for the record. Uh, just on that last question by Mr. Alvidris, uh, we've been empowered to say that if, if the proposed changes that, that Mr. Gorman put in his testimony would, would be adopted in the final order that in a area not only would not oppose, but we would support the proposed transaction. Um, and of course the devil's in the details, but I, I just didn't want the impression to be that that we're going to stand neutral. Well, I guess I have a question for Mr. Gorman. Uh, you said there's still some separations between what you recommend, you recommend uh, the joint applicants are accepting. Is that right? Uh, that, that's right. There was a few stip points in the my testimony that were not adopted by the joint applicants. And, and what are those? Um, and I can't say that they they would limit our willingness to not oppose the stipulation or support the stipulation. Um, the, uh, you know, they will be briefed uh, by by the lawyers, but and I have not a formal list of those, but they deal with the timing of the reliability group, um, creating restrictions on um, the determination of whether or not uh, PNM will join an RTO. Um, and uh, the workings of the carbon task force um, and its interaction with uh, PNM's current integrated resource planning is not clear, um, but we are in favor of the planning process that addresses the system and selecting resources that meets the multifaceted faceted objectives of high quality, reliable service, carbon reduction, but at the most reasonable prices to customers. I didn't understand the first thing you, you mentioned, timing of the reliability group, what's that? In uh, paragraph thirty six, the third bullet, uh, we the stipulation uh, stated it would come up with a reliability group within 180 days. I think the applicants suggested that it should be about a year to develop that group. Um, I can't say that the, uh, the applicant's concern is, is something we would not find reasonable. All right, well, thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Gould, did you have any redirect? Uh, yes, Mr. Schoenauer, I have a little redirect. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Gorman, uh, would you, just to follow up on the uh, last questions by the hearing examiner, would you turn in your July uh, 16th testimony to uh, page 40 of, of that testimony. From there. And if you look at line 22 on page, uh, page 40 down there, you see that? Yes, I do. That, we, we, uh, is, is it true to state that NM area has a disagreement with uh, paragraph 44 of the current 
of the second amended stipulation when it states that the carbon reduction goals um, of PNM are of preeminent importance and should have preeminent importance in incentivizing the executives. Is that a fair statement of yes. Anamiria's position? Yes. And and what are, are it, it, as far as you know, are Anamiria members um, opposed to rapid decarbonization? They are not. They, they support it and done within the confines of prudent and, and reliable integrated resource planning. So would it be a fair statement that that we would support, NMRA would support having uh, a more rapid decarbonization as one of the, the incentive uh, factors, but not the preeminent one? That's Would correct. That be a fair statement. Yeah. Um, if you would look at the your your page thirty nine, which deals with the carbon task force, I'm there, and that's page forty five of the regulatory commitments in the second amended stipulation. Um, you had a, a lot of cross examination with Ms. Dezur about that. Do you recall that? Yeah, I think it was paragraph 43 through yes. 44 of the second amendment stipulation. Yes, I do recall that cross-examination. And isn't your concern uh, that if you have two independent planning processes, one that's completely regulated by the commission under the IRP rule with hearings and public advisory process, that creating a brand new undefined task force to do the same job is going to create confusion in, in the planning process? I think it has the potential of doing that, yes. And, and that's really the objection. Would, do you believe that you would object to a carbon reduction task force that was incorporated within the IRP process? If it, if, if it doesn't restrict the IRP process from conducting itself in the normal manner for evaluating the, the multiple objectives of identifying resources that achieve the, the objectives of system reliability, um, carbon reduction, and reasonable prices to customers, then I, I think it would be a worthwhile endeavor for the commission. And have you seen any evidence from uh, CCAE in this case that the IRP process is not working? I am not aware of any evidence of that, no. Okay. And then going back to Mr. Michael's questions, his theoretical questions about uh, the impact of, of uh, weather changes on uh, on reliability and affordability. You remember that those, that cross examination? Yes, I do. And he asked you in the context of that that uh, isn't it possible that you can have a reliable service that's not affordable? You recall that question? I do. It's also possible if you don't have a coordinated um, planning system that you could do rapid decarbonization, but that could result in unaffordability. Isn't that a, a fair concern? It is, and it could also impact reliability. So it's very important in your, in your estimation that all of these factors be considered in a, a holistic IRP process. Is that a fair statement? That is a, that's an accurate statement, yes. And you are acquainted with the fact that PNM has a, a planning department, are you not? Yes, they do. And, and uh, are you also aware that, that uh, PNM's planning department has access to sophisticated uh, computer modeling for thousands of scenarios and hundreds of, of various uh, proposed portfolios? That is traditional utility resource planning, statistical methodologies. It's yes, and I am I have not specifically worked on a PNM resource integrated resource plan, but others in my firm have, and it is my understanding that they do rely on those sophisticated statistical methodologies to uh, review the the economics and the reliability of very resource portfolios and identifying you know, the, the best and the lowest cost option that can achieve the 
the, the objectives of the plan. And that typically is system reliability, um, affordability and carbon uh, decarbonization. Mr. Hingrisano, those are all the questions I have. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gorman, appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Appreciate your flexibility and uh, you're excused. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're gonna go on to, I noticed that uh, the two uh, MSR witnesses are available, uh, but those will go pretty quickly. Uh, I'd like to ask that uh, Mr. O'Connell be available uh, this afternoon as well, uh, after uh, those two witnesses are, are completed. Uh, Mr. Michael, can we do that? You're muted? Yeah, we, yeah, we can, if I can figure out how to turn on my video and mute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've talked to Mr. O'Connell. Uh, Ms. Beasley may be uh, uh, um, putting on his testimony, but yes, he's available today. She looked kind of startled when you said that. You mean Ms. Beatles? <laughs> yeah, did I, is that not what I said? You said Ms. Beasley. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, Ms. I was looking at Ms. Beasley when I was saying Ms trying to say Ms. Beatles. Yeah. Um, All right. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Virtue, there you are. Uh, would you uh, proceed with your, your first witness? Yes, Mr. Hearing Examiner. Um, I would like to call Mr. David Arthur as our first witness and ask that he be sworn in. Would you please raise your right hand? You do so much for the testimony you're about to give in the matter not penny. It should be the truth, all truth, and nothing but the truth. He's muted. You're muted, you're muted, muted. David. Can you muted? It's a microphone icon in the lower left of your screen. Can there you, you go. Now? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Was I'm sorry, has he been sworn? Uh, he did not say yes to the oath. Can I say yes to the oath? I heard you read it. Yes, sir. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Mr. Arthur. Uh, would you please state your full name for the record? <clears throat> it's David L. Arthur. By whom and in what capacity are you employed? I am representing uh, Los Alamos and MSR in the merger case. And are you have do you have uh, separate employment uh, through which you provide? Uh, testimony and other consulting services? I do, I am employed by KBT Energy and KBT Energy has a contract. Okay, thank you. Um, have you previously filed written testimony in this case? I have. <clears throat> Is your testimony identified as Los Alamos MSR Exhibit 1, which is a direct testimony of David L. Arthur dated April 2nd, 2021? and Los Alamos MSR Exhibit 2, testimony in support of second amended stipulation of David L. Arthur, date, dated uh, June 18th. Yes. Do you have those exhibits in front of you? I do. Were those exhibits prepared uh, by you or under your direction? Yes. Do you have any corrections to make to those exhibits at this time? No. And are those exhibits uh, in your testimony contained therein true and correct to the best of your knowledge? Yes. And do you adopt the previously filed written testimony being Los Alamos MSR, MSR Exhibit 1 and Los Alamos MSR Exhibit 2 as your testimony today? Yes. 
Okay, I would move for the admission of Los Alamos and Los Alamos and MSR exhibits one and two. Is there any objection? Uh, hearing none, uh, Los Alamos MSR exhibits one and two are admitted. Okay, I'll pass the witness. Okay, uh, Mr. Albright, uh, you reserved uh, seven minutes for Mr. Arthur. Uh, yes, sir, I, I have. Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Arthur. Good afternoon. I'm uh, Jeff Albright with uh, J. Albright Law LLC, and I represent Bernalillo County. Um, going to primarily uh, focus on your June 18th, 2021 testimony in support of the Second Amendment stipulation. If you want to pull that up, please. I have it. Okay. And um, just uh, by way of background, is, is MSR and LAC customers of PM? I'm not familiar with that. Well, do you, do you receive, when you say you're not familiar, are, is, is Los Alamos, where does Los Alamos receive its electricity from? I, I, I don't have that information. Okay. And is MSR a customer of PNM? I don't believe so. All right, so on page three, uh, of that testimony, beginning at lines 13 through basically 17, you state that such an ex escalation, and this is relating to San Juan, would likely require future PM, MSR, and LAC customers to bear such costs in the form of higher rates, even though they never received the benefits of San Juan. Can you, can you explain that, please? Yes, future customers are not necessarily any of the customers that ever received any of the output from San Juan. But if the decommissioning costs exceed what was authorized initially, they have to be made up by the owners and the owners will then pass those costs along to their customers. And those could easily be customers that never received any of the output from San Juan. So when you're talking about costs to the customers here, you're talking about uh, is it a correct statement that you're talking about it in, in terms of ownership interest in San Juan? I'm talking about the ownership interest in San Juan receiving additional costs that they then turn around and pass on to their retail electric customers. All right, it is my understanding that Los Alamos is served by one of the electric uh, co-ops. And assuming that that uh, is a uh, true subject to check, um, because these costs would be passed to Los Alamos as an owner, you're saying that that somehow would get passed on to the customers of the electric co-op? I am not familiar in detail with Los Alamos, but with the MSR members, they would flow those costs on to their customers. Okay. I just did, did not have a clear picture of, uh, of how, that, how that worked. Well, just, just to clarify, for example, in the case of MSR, in effect, the customers are the citizens and therefore they are also the owners of MSR individually as the M, the S and the R. And so, there, for example, are no stockholders to pass the costs on to as an alternative. Okay, but not as recipients of the generated electricity as far as electric rates go. Well, all costs go into the revenue requirement that then is the basis for the rates for the retail customers. Okay. Are you familiar with the, have you looked at Ms. Reno's uh, testimony on behalf of Bernalillo County? Uh, very briefly. All right. With, with regard to the representations that have been made with respect to uh, increase in, in overall rate credits, do, does either MSR or LAC have any objection to that? 
I can't speak for MSR. I am, I'm simply their, their witness with respect to the decommissioning issue. I see. And what about LAC? Uh, sa same applies to them. Same applies. So you don't have a position on any of the proposed uh, changes with regard to economic development or any of those types of things? No, that, that's outside of what I was asked to evaluate. Okay, fair enough. With regard to decommissioning that you talk about, um, have you quantified what the delay in decommissioning would cost, say if there's a six month delay or a 12 month delay in the, in the um, decommissioning of San Juan, which currently my understanding is uh, June of 2022, is that correct? That is my understanding. And have you done any calculations with regard to what an impact, what impact that would have if it were delayed six months or delayed 12 months? It, it is my understanding that studies are being done to try and better quantify that. Okay, but they aren't, they aren't done yet then. I, I'm not familiar with, I, I did in my testimony cite one item that had increased in cost over the last number of months. And do you know who is performing those studies and when they might be uh, expected to be available? I do not. Uh, Mr. Schonauer, um, um, I, uh, uh, hearing examiner, Mr. Hearing examiner, I have no further questions for, uh, for Dr. Arthur. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Ar Arthur, for your testimony. Appreciate the responses. Thank you. Well, Dr. Arthur, I have, uh, a couple of questions for you. Um, could you turn to your, uh, I guess it's what the June, June 18 testimony? Yes. Uh, the bottom of page four, and then continuing on to page five, there's a question, is the site reuse case a full demolition plan? And your answer on page five is yes, in substantial part. Uh, and then you go on to explain more. But then on page eight, you, you discuss the uh, proposed Farmington and Chant project. And, uh, and, and I, the way I understand your testimony is that uh, uh, the, the site reuse case will not conflict with the uh, Farmington and Chant project. Is that right? Uh, that would not be my understanding. Okay. What I was stating in my testimony is, is that with getting the site prepared for reuse, then it could come and be used for another purpose that might be beneficial to that community. If the process is delayed, which it is my understanding the enchantment effort would entail, it would then delay indefinitely preparing that site for other uses. Okay, so does the uh, provision in the settlement, uh, paragraph 56, then uh, conflict with the uh, ability of the of Farmington and Enchant to develop the uh, uh, Enchant project? I, I, I can't speak whether it does or does not in the sense that what paragraph 56 does is it commits PNM to using a good faith effort to proceed on coming up with the best whole life solution to the problem that is cost effective. And if you take the life cycle costs into account and you take least cost into account, and if that turns out to be an outcome that is different from, from the full demolition, then it will have met those tests. And in that sense, uh, it appears to me that PNM is, is acting in a prudent manner that is in the public interest. And, 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 and it referenced PNM because PNM is, is a significant party to the process and it has significant voting influence for what is finally to be done. So if the if PNM develops this uh, this plan for uh, 
demolition or decommissioning, let's say. And it turns out that uh, that plan does conflict with the, uh, with the Enchant project, uh, with the development of the Enchant project. Uh, will, does this paragraph 56 require PNM to oppose the, the right of the city of Farmington to acquire the San Juan uh, generating station? I, I, I think that the ability or inability of Farmington to acquire the facility is a function of what is under the ownership agreement that I have only limited familiarity with. And if within that framework, it works out that they are able to purchase it with the assent of the various owners, then it would go that direction. If the owners choose a different direction consistent with the voting requirements within the ownership agreement, then it will go a different direction. It's up to the owners to decide. Well, and p and is one of those owners, right? Yes, they are. And couldn't p and block the, uh, the transfer to Farmington if, it, uh, if that was its uh, intention? I don't, I think if you, it's my understanding the ownership agreement, there are two tests. There is a test based on ownership interests and there are tests based on the number of owners. And if both those tests are met, it would not be a unilateral action by p &M. It would be an action on the part of the owners acting through the ownership agreement. And then the outcome would be what it is. So are you aware of whether the ownership agreement requires a unanimous uh, vote to, uh, to uh, proceed with the transfer of the uh, station to, uh, to Farmington? It, it's my understanding that a supermajority can enter into the decommissioning process. And uh, can PNM? How what's PNM's share uh, of that plant that would? Uh, I I don't recall. It's it, there's been some restructuring of the ownership interests as a result of the shutdown of of two of the units and the retention of two other units. And, and when you say supermajority, what what does that mean? Supermajority means a percentage that is greater than 50%. I think it's like two thirds, or three quarters. Do you know for, for sure? I do not. I mean, I have looked at it once, but I, my recollection has it in the two thirds to three quarters. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's all I have. Uh, is there any redirect? Uh just one or two questions, Mr. Hearing Examiner. Uh, Mr. Arthur, uh, are you aware uh, whether MSR and Los Alamos uh, would oppose the Farmington Enchant project if an agreement uh, to keep the, the plant open as a result of that project were agreed to by the owners? Uh, it's my understanding that if the liability associated with the deferral and decommissioning were properly hedged, that then they likely would be supportive. But I can't speak for them. Their respective boards have to ultimately speak for each of them. Okay. Um, let me look at my notes here for a second. Uh, that's the only question I have at this point. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Arthur. You're excused. Thank you. Mr. Virtue? Yes, we would call Mr. Vincent Tumorello. And ask that he be sworn. 
Mr. Tuberell, would you raise your right hand, please? Do I see him? Oh, there. Uh, you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give in the matter not pending to be the truth, all truth, and nothing but the truth? I Thank you. Mr. Tumorella, would you please state your full name for the record? Yes, my name is Vincent R. Tumorella. And by whom and in what capacity are you employed? I'm employed by uh, E3 Consulting Company. I'm sorry, Judge, I can't hear him. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me if I get closer. I'm employed by E3 Consulting Company. And I'm, I'm, sorry. Sorry. I'm sorry, you're going to have to get even closer than that. Judge, he's breaking up. Or something. All right, let's let's try that. Is that is that better? That's better. I'm employed yes, by. I'm in, okay, I'm employed by E3 Consulting Company. Uh, located the headquarters is located in Denver, Colorado, and I'm a managing director with that firm. I've been employed there for 14 years. Excuse me, excuse me. Have you previously filed written testimony in this case? Yes, I have. And is your testimony identified as Los Alamos MSR Exhibit 3, direct testimony of Vincent Tumorello, dated April 2nd, 2021? That is correct. And do you have that exhibit in front of you? I do. And was it prepared by you or under your direct supervision? Yes. Do you have any corrections to make at this time to the exhibit? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. I do not. Okay, thank you. Is your written direct testimony true and correct to the best of your knowledge? Yes, it is. And do you adopt the testimony contained in LAC MSR Exhibit 3 as your testimony here today? Yes, I do. I would move the admission of LAC MSR Exhibit 3 into the record. Is there any objection? Hearing no objection, LAC MSR Exhibit 3 is admitted. Pass the witness. Okay, Mr. Albright, you have six minutes for this witness. Uh, yes, Your Honor, I do. Just a few questions. Good afternoon, Mr. Uh, Tumorello. Have I pronounced that uh, correctly? That's correct. Good afternoon, sir. Okay. I'm uh, Jeff Albright with J. Albright Law LLC representing Bernalillo County. Just have a few questions related to your testimony of April 2, uh, 2021. Uh, would you turn to page 13, please? Yes, I will. Okay, I have a couple of questions uh, beginning at, I'm a little bit confused with regard to the question beginning at line five. Um, it states, if you were informed that the owners of the Four Corners generating station located to the south of San Juan generating station have agreed to demolish and restore the project site within three years of cessation or generation, and in no case later than 2041, does this change any recommendation you would make regarding the demolition or restoration of the San Juan Generating Station? Have I stated that correctly? Yeah, that was the question and the response was no. And the answer was no. And could you explain how the Four Corners Generating Station impacts the San Juan Generating Station? I don't know that it has a direct impact response to the question. I'm sorry, sir. You're going to have to get closer. I don't know that it has a direct impact. Okay, let me let me try to elaborate on my response. We're getting quite a bit uh, of echo back, uh, Mr. Timorello. Uh, I'm sorry, let me try it again. Uh, my response to that question was no, and the second, the following question asked for further explanation, and my recommendation, my answer to that response to question was, 
we would uh, we would I would recommend that the San Juan generating station follow that a similar plan as described for the Four Corners generating station. Okay, and I just want to make sure that I understand what you mean by a similar plan. Are you are you recommending recommending a demolition or repurposing? Well, the San Juan plan, the, the Four Corners plan, as best that I understand it, is to be demolished. You know, it says in no case later than 2041. So that's some some defined time after after the cessation of generation. And I would recommend the same type of plan be adopted for the San Juan generating station, barring somebody else wanting to purchase it for some other purpose. Okay, so that statement does not take into account the NTEC contract between PNM and NTEC, correct? I'm not sure if I understand your question, sir. All right, let me see if I can rephrase it. So, um, so PN, do you understand that PNM has entered into an agreement with NTEC to continue operation of the plant? The after P and M. No, I'm talking Four Corners now. I'm very familiar with the details of the Four Corners operation or future plans. Okay. And then in a question on page 13, you say would immediately demolition and restoration reduce risks and costs to P and M and its ratepayers and result in prudent cost avoidance. Your answer is yes, in my opinion. How would it reduce the risks and costs for the San Juan generating station to undergo immediately immediate demolition? Yeah, further on in the testimony, I elaborated on the risk factors. Um, I can find it. Maybe it's earlier in the testimony. There are, there are several things that would create risk by doing a retirement in place scenario for the San Juan generating station? Mr. Tumarello, you need to face the, the camera for us to be able to hear you. When you turn your head, you're not speaking into the microphone and, and it becomes all garbled. So well, you face us, if you face us, we'll be able to hear you. I will try to do better. Uh, to answer the question, I'm, I'm thumbing through the testimony. <laughs> On page, starting on page six, at the bottom, line 20, I, I enumerated the risk of delaying the demolition of the plant, and it continues on page seven, and those risks are, in my testimony, increased ongoing O&M costs, decreased salvage value of the equipment, increased ultimate demolition costs, uh, likely increasing environmental regulate, remediation and safety regulations, which would add to cost. Uh, the possibility that any existing groundwater contamination would spread over time, which would also increase the root of remediation cost. Um, the possibility with an on, with a unremediated site that it would be it would come under stricter jurisdiction of um, the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation Liability Act, you know, it would become a Superfund site, and failure to maintain a rigorous site security program expose, exposes the, the owners to increased legal liabilities. So those are the primary risks I see in delaying the demolition of the San Juan generating station. Have you done any quantitative analysis? on any of those? No, I have not. Do you know of anyone who has? On this particular project? No, sir, I do not. Okay, Mr. Hearing Examiner, that's all the questions I have for Mr. Uh, Tumarella. Thank you very much. Well, you're welcome, sir. Uh, Mr. Virtue, is there any redirect? Uh, I think just have one, Mr. Hearing Examiner. Regarding uh, the question, that you were asked, Mr. Tumorello, uh, 
about your testimony on page 313 regarding the uh, decommissioning of Four Corners as compared to the decommissioning of San Juan. Would it be fair to say that you were addressing the timing of decommissioning post-closure with respect to the differential in treatment of the timing of decommissioning post-closure of those two plants and you weren't addressing the, the actual timing of closure of Four Corners, just the timing of decommissioning of Four Corners vis-a-vis -vis San Juan. That is correct, sir. Okay, thank you, nothing further. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Tumarello. Um, you're excused. Well, you're welcome, thank you. Okay, uh, Ms. Beatles, uh, are you ready to present uh, Mr. O'Connell? Uh, yes, I am. Uh, Western Resource Advocates calls Patrick J. O'Connell. Good afternoon. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Would you raise your right hand, sir? You sound like for the testimony you're about to give the matter up and it shall be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Yes. Thank you. For the record, Mr. O'Connell, would you please state your name and your employer and your position with your employer? My name is Patrick O'Connell. I'm a senior policy analyst for Western Resource Advocates. Thank you. Uh, I am now going to be seeking to introduce uh, three exhibits uh, reflecting testimonies that you have filed in this case. Um, the first is your April 2nd direct testimony. I have labeled that as WRA Exhibit 2. Do you have that before you? Yes, I do. Um, and did we make any changes or corrections to that testimony for purposes of uploading um, a, uh, for, uh, before we uploaded that document to the Dropbox? No. So there are no changes or corrections, right? Correct. And if you were to answer today those same questions, would your answers be the same? Yes. And are they true and correct to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes. I move the admission of WRA Exhibit 2. Any objection? WRA Exhibit 2 is admitted. Thank you. Um, now, Mr. O'Connell, please direct your attention to your June 17th testimony in support of the stipulation that I have marked as WRA Exhibit 4. Do you have that before you? Yes. <laughs> And did we did make some corrections, simply the addition of line numbers to the version we uploaded to the Dropbox compared to what was earlier filed in the docket. Is that right? Yes. And other than that change, uh, did you have any other changes or corrections to WRA Exhibit 4? No. And if you were to answer today those same questions, would your answers be the same? Yes. And are they true and correct to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes. I move the admission of WRA Exhibit 4. Any objection? WRA Exhibit 4 is admitted. Thank you. And now to your uh, third and last testimony filed in this docket. The, your July 29th testimony in response to opposition to stipulation that I have labeled as WRA Exhibit 6. Do you have that? Yes. Thank you. And again, uh, were there any changes or corrections that we caused to be made to the uploaded version? No. If you were to answer today the same questions in WRA Exhibit 6, would your answers be the same? Yes. And are they true and correct to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes. I move the admission of WRA Exhibit 6. Any objection? Hearing none, WRA Exhibit 6 is admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. We now uh, pass the witness for cross-examination. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Water Authority has uh, 10 minutes reserved. Uh, 
Uh, we waive that, uh, Mr. Hearing Examiner. Who said that? Dal Harris. Okay. Uh, Mr. Albright, you've reserved 25 minutes. Uh, yes, Mr. Hearing Examiner. I don't think I'll need uh, need uh, much or uh, all of that. I certainly won't need all of it, and probably not that much. So uh, thank you, uh, Mr. O'Connell. Good to see you again. Good afternoon. Uh, again, Jeff Albright with J. Albright Law, LLC, representing Bernalillo County. Uh, I'd like you to turn to, first of all, your direct testimony of April 2, 2021, please. Okay. Um, and preliminary question. You worked for PNM before, correct? Yes, prior to working for Western Resource Advocates, I'd worked for PNM for about 22 years. And when did you leave PNM to join WRA? Um, it was in the fall, or sorry, the spring of 2019. So March 2019. I left PNM and started in at Western Resource Advocates in April 2019. Okay. Uh, on page three, and I'm I was just a little curious. On page three at line 15, one of the elements of this uh, merger acquisition and in the stipulation is that by December 1, 2022, PNM will name a chief environmental officer with significant environmental protection and climate change experience responsible for meeting or exceeding PNM's carbon reduction goals. Do you see that? Have I quoted that correctly? Yes. Do you have any idea or knowledge whether that will be, it says we'll name a chief environmental officer. Do you anticipate that this will come from, from someone internal to PNM? Uh, that's certainly possible. I don't know. So it could be either a new hire or somebody internally at, uh, at PNM. Yes, both of those are possibilities. I'd also expect there will be, you know, quite a turnover in the operation just because of the merger. Uh, PNM's retirement of San Juan will change workforce needs. So there will be a lot of. Uh, people moving to new seats within PNM, whether that includes this position or not, I don't know. Are you opting to be chief environmental officer? No. No, <laughs> just thought I would ask. I would like you to also turn to well, before, before I leave that, do you, do you own any, when you were at PNM, I assume that you acquired or were paid or received some stock. Do you have uh, PNM stock in your ownership or your family's ownership or in a trust? Objection. No. Overruled. No, I don't. You don't? Would you turn to your testimony of July 29, 2021? Uh, excuse me, is that June 17th? Now, let's see. Maybe I looked at the wrong date here. No, I'm looking at the July. I'm looking at the July 29, 2021. At least that's the date on it. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm there. Response to the opposition to the stipulation? There yeah, exhibit six. Exhibit six, yes, I'm sorry. I want, to, want you to turn to page eight, please. Okay. And there you're responding to Ms. Reno's recommendation. You say, why is Ms. Reno's recommendation inadvisable? 
and you answer that no one utility can form or can control an RTO. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And that's at line seven. So is it your understanding that PNM will form or merely be, or take the lead in forming an RTO, whether they will just be another participating IOU in that process? Um, quite a bit of testimony has been provided on an issue in this hearing, Correct. including from Dr. Howe. Yep. Um, clearly, PNM on its own forming an RTO is, is silly as a concept. Uh, I expect that uh, PNM will participate with neighboring utilities. Um, what makes sense to me would be utilities and uh, other load serving entities and possibly tri-state in New Mexico, Arizona, Southern Nevada at a minimum. And why would a rulemaking proceeding that does that, or at least invites that participation along with public entities not be a better option? Uh, the purpose of that regulatory commitment in the stipulation is just to ensure that PNM participates in whatever process is available to PNM. Uh, I think the concept that the New Mexico Public Regulation Commission would take the lead on forming an RTO is an interesting thing, but uh, frankly, uh, wouldn't expect any one utility commission in those states I mentioned to lead it. Basically, a group of the willing will form. And, and frankly, having New Mexico Public Regulation Commission lead it might lead exactly to what Ms. Reno is trying to avoid, which is limiting participation. Have you been, there's been some testimony with regard to the creation of RTOs in Colorado and Nevada. Are you aware of that? The testimony that I heard is that similar to the impact of the stipulation in this case, utilities in Colorado and Nevada are now looking to figure out how best an RTO can be organized. But there was some legislation that's been um, introduced, maybe even passed in Colorado and Nevada, correct? Are you aware of that? I believe that's what Dr. Howe said. Was WRA involved in that process? I'm sure WRA was. Uh, we have a uh, regional markets team within Western Resource Advocates. I'm not on that team. I try to be supportive as I can, but I don't monitor it on a daily basis. So you were not involved in that process at all with regard to the legislation in Colorado or Nevada? Personally, no. Okay, Mr. Hearing Examiner, that's all the questions I have for uh, Mr. O'Connell. Uh, Mr. O'Connell, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. <clears throat> Mr. Marks, you have 10 minutes reserved for uh, Mr. O'Connell. Thank you. Uh, Mr. O'Connell, uh, uh, under merger commitment 44, PM executives can receive additional compensation for reducing emissions on PM's books, regardless of whether those emissions are simply shifted to another company, correct? I, I just figured you had the whole document memorized word for word. <laughs> Uh, I don't believe that that uh, commitment is as specific as you portrayed it. Uh, would you agree that as written into the agreement, the only thing it mentions is achievement of PNM's 2040 carbon reduction targets or earlier? Well, the actual text of what it says is that relevant PNM executives will include goals related to the achievement of PNM's 2040 carbon reduction targets. So to me, first of all, the purpose of this uh, paragraph is if executives are given an incentive goal, 
they will work to make sure that the entire organization supports them in achieving that goal. And so also concept of paragraph 43, Carbon Reduction Task Force, in order to achieve this zero goal as reliably and cost effectively as possible, and as noted in my testimony, it would be hoove PNM to think about it globally more than just the generation fleet. Uh, think about it from the operations point of view, think about it from the customer's point of view. So those might all be goals that are supportive of reaching this carbon reduction target. Would you agree? I, I think we're, would you agree that uh, it would, if not counterproductive, it would certainly be suboptimal to incentivize PNM executives to simply transfer carbon emitting resources off the company's books and that implementation of paragraph 44 should also include, uh, uh, or should not incentivize uh, transfers that turn into leakage. Um, I don't see anything in paragraph 44 that would give PNM incentive to move carbon emissions off their books or anything that incents leakage. Uh, that, that wasn't my question. Sorry, Mr. or McConnell. aiding the, or aiding the. I, I don't see it's... anything in the paragraph that incents leakage, I think is where we left off Mr. Lee. And, and Mr. O'Connell, you, you told me that this paragraph is, is general and calls for certain types of things, but does not specify. And I'm asking you, would you agree with me that when it's implemented, that it should not allow an incentive to be issued when the result is leakage? I agree that leakage is not um, a desirable outcome. I am not agreeing with you that this paragraph gives the incentive to per, or incentive to pursue policies or programs that would lead to leakage. And as I described in my testimony, the provisions in this uh, stipulation also require uh, PNM to look at their system holistically. There's, for example, another paragraph in here: contract impacts on emissions. Um, the Carbon Reduction Task Force is a six-month stakeholder engagement okay, process. So there's no way that I can see that PNM would pursue that path without some form of accountability in the system. If you look at the stipulation or the regulatory commitments in the stipulation as a whole, okay, that that that's a long answer, and I don't. And I'm just asking you for yes or no. Do you think that any incentive mechanism? should not reward leakage. Objection, asked and answered. Overruled. I agree that PM executives should not be incentive if they are pursuing strategies to do nothing but create leakage. Uh, that, that's not the question. It, not nothing but create leakage. Should, should any incentive mechanism not reward leakage? Yes or no? Objection, asked and answered. Just because Mr. Marks doesn't like Mr. O'Connell's response doesn't mean that he hasn't answered his question. Well, I don't think he gave a direct answer. So I'm overruling the objection. I, I'm not giving you a yes or no answer because in my mind, in my experience, you have to look at this as a system. And so you're trying to reduce this to a binary choice. And I think that that's, wrong. So I'm not answering yes or no. Thank you. Um, if we look at your rebuttal testimony, um, page 12, please. Uh, you seem to be criticizing uh, Mr. Fisher for uh, uh, on, on the basis that the PRC doesn't have jurisdiction over the Four Corners power plant because it's on tribal land. Is, Am I reading that correctly? Uh, 
And I'm referring to page line seven and eight, where you say, ignores that the Four Corners plant is on tribal land and cannot be regulated as part of the New Mexico requirement. Yeah, I agree that that is in my testimony. My primary criticism with Dr. Fisher's recommendation is it, as stated, appears to be incenting people to obey the law. Uh, okay. And that's a minimum, not something eligible for incentives. But, but you'd agree that the PRC has jurisdiction over PNM's actions concerning its ownership share of Four Corners? I agree that the PRC has jurisdiction over PNM. Dr. Fisher cited the Energy Transition Act and emission limits. That, I believe, would be the purview of New Mexico Environment Department. New Mexico Environment Department does not regulate air emissions at the Four Corners power plant. Do you believe that uh, the PRC should consider and uh, should consider how PNM's actions will impact the operations of Four Corners? Yes. And. Do you agree that, uh, I think I've been there. Uh, one last question. Uh, do you know whether uh, all the parties in this case had an opportunity to review merger commitment 44 and provide feedback on it before it went into the final document? And to remind myself what 44 is. Well, is the paragraph we 44, you... the first A version of paragraph 44 appeared in my testimony on April 2nd. And so any party that wanted to discuss my suggestion was welcome to reach out to me, for example. Um, my experience working through this process was if parties contacted the joint applicants, they, they would get their attention. And there, were, there was a meeting where uh, everybody got together to talk about um, what their interests and goals were in this case. So I, I believe everybody had an opportunity to review paragraph 44 before the filing of the second stipulation. Uh, I, I do have one last question, I think. Uh, do you, Mr. Fisher, Dr. Fisher is recommending that either the merger commitment be revised or the effect be that incentive mechanisms take to, into consideration both progress towards PM zero carbon goals, but also take into consideration um, leakage effects outside of PM uh, from its actions. Do you agree that that? would be a good thing. I agree that it would have been great to talk to Dr. Fisher before he filed his testimony and it's possible we could have come to an agreement, but he did not and we're where we are. But do you agree that would be a good thing as long as there were case by case, um, you know, that there was the ability to, to look at things on a case by case basis if, if those general principles didn't make sense in one particular case? I agree that that's a conversation I would love to have going forward with Dr. Fisher. At the moment, we're looking at merger approval with a filed set of regulatory commitments. Uh, but you're not answering my question, Mr. O'Connell. Mr. O'Connell, my question is, do you agree it would be a good thing to have an incentive mechanism that does what you think it should do in terms of incentivizing PNM to accelerate its own emissions reductions but also takes into consideration uh, avoiding leakage whenever that is possible. Objection, yes or no, would that be a good an thing? Answer. I don't see how this question is any different from he, the one that Mr. O'Connell just responded to. Maybe he, he didn't, oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Beatles. He didn't respond, he, he keeps responding. I should have had this, we should have had a discussion. I'm asking him about a mechanism and a principle. Maybe and his opinion on uh, overruled. It. Overruled, let's go. I agree that that mechanism in principle sounds attractive. 
Uh, the point I was making is what we're dealing with right now is what the joint applicants have agreed to. So you're, you're asking me a hypothetical question. So that, that's why I wasn't giving you a direct answer because you're asking me to imagine something. Thanks, Mr. O'Connell. Thank you, uh, Mr. Schottenauer. Thank you, Ms. Beatles. I'm done. Thank you. Okay, uh, next is staff. Uh, Mr. Borman, you have 10 minutes. Uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> good afternoon, Mr. O'Connell. Good afternoon. I'm going to try to get my documents here organized. Um, so let's see. Can you turn to your testimony in response to opposition to stipulation? I believe that's WRA Exhibit 6. I'm there. Okay, and on page 10, um, I think it begins on uh, line 21. Um, you state that Mr. Gorman takes issue with the preeminence of the importance of climate change to PNM's planning and operations. Do you see that? Yes. Now, is this in response to comments that Mr. Gorman raised about paragraph 44 of the second amended stipulation? Yes. Okay. And I believe, and do you have um, the second amended stipulation? I believe that's joint applicants exhibit two. Yes. Okay. And I believe the statement um, in that paragraph that is at issue is the very first sentence. The joint applicants agree that the carbon reduction goals set forth above are of preeminent importance. Do you see that? Yes. Okay. And that's that's the, I guess, area of dispute that you and Mr. Gorman seem to be having, right? Yes. Okay. What does preeminent mean? Uh, my understanding is preeminent is a, an organizing principle. It's, it's the first idea. And so I addressed what my understanding of preeminence in terms and why it's important to have it in paragraph 44 on page 11, starting on line five of my, uh, of WRA exhibit six. Okay. Well, would you agree or accept that at least one definition of preeminent is surpassing all others? Uh, I'll accept that. Okay. Well then, is it your position that the carbon reduction goals set forth in the second amended stipulation surpass the statutorily declared purpose of the Public Utility Act that reasonable and proper services shall be available at fair, just, and reasonable rates? Uh, no, I mean, it's p &M's responsibility to operate and manage its system to deliver what the Public Utility Act requires. We're in a moment now where the events of climate change have happened to where it's not if or when, but how much. If you look at the IPCC report that came out just a couple of weeks ago, the effects of climate change are happening. So in its management of this system, things like reliability, affordability, safety are all issues that need to be viewed from a lens that disruptive events like severe weather are more common and more severe. So climate change is preeminent because if they don't think about the operation and management of their system, through that lens, they're not going to succeed at what the law requires them to do. But it doesn't surpass the, the goals of the PUA as set forth in section 62-3-1B, correct? Yeah, the point of this paragraph is it's of preeminent importance to PNM. Okay. I have no further questions. Thank you, Mr. O'Connell. Thank you. Okay, I have no questions. Uh, Ms. Beatles, do you have any redirect? 
Um, yes, I do. Thank you on one point. Um, if you know, Mr. O'Connell, do any other utilities located in New Mexico belong to a regional transmission organization? Yes, uh, Southwest Public Service on the eastern side of New Mexico is in SPP. Uh, and do you know if the PRC approved SPS joining SPP? I believe it did. And do you know whether that was pursuant to a rulemaking proceeding? Uh, I don't believe it was. Um, are there any drawbacks or disadvantages to PNM being part of a multi-state or multi-utility effort to explore RTOs for the West? There's no drawbacks to exploring. Uh, the whole premise of my testimony is there is value in planning. Uh, the market has changed in some fundamental ways. Lots more renewable energy is here. More is coming because of its cost. Uh, an RTO gives PNM and its neighbors opportunities to create a more efficient system. And so what this stipulation paragraph requires PNM to do is to consider the benefit of joining such an organization for its customers. So there aren't drawbacks to that. Thank you, Mr. O'Connell. That's all I have, Your Honor. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. O'Connell. Thank you for your testimony. You're excused. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's uh, let's go off the record at this point and talk about uh, uh, witnesses for tomorrow. Uh, I'm looking at uh, this list of remaining witnesses and uh, tell me, uh, people, who's available for tomorrow? Let's start with uh, the water. Well, the NM area. I think, Mr. Gould, you said that James Dauphiné is not available tomorrow. He's available on Thursday. Mr. Gould? Okay, well, let's go to Mr. Harris. Uh, are either of your witnesses available tomorrow? Yes, it's my understanding, Mr. Hearn Examiner, that uh, Mr. Mark Garrett would be available tomorrow afternoon. And what about David Garrett? It's my understanding that uh, the, the parties except uh, Bernalillo County have waived cross of Mr. David Garrett. Uh, and I'm, I'm not updated on, on uh, the status of whether Bernalillo County wants to uh, cross-examine, but I don't believe he will be available tomorrow. Mr. Albright, are you still intending to cross-examine uh, David Garrett? Uh, let me just uh, check. I had I had spoken with uh, Miss Winter earlier, and I can get back to you in about two or two or three minutes with respect to that. I only need to cross, I think I only need to cross uh, uh, either either Mr. Mark Garrett or Mr. David Garrett. I just need to check uh, here just a second. And, and the other parties have agreed to waive their cross of uh, David Garrett? Mr. Hearing Examiner, this is Brian Haverly on behalf of Avon Grid, and we do not intend at this point to ask any questions of Mr. David Garrett. Mr. Alvidrez. You're on mute, Mr. Alvidrez. All right, yes, that's correct as well. And uh, Ms. Beatles. You're asking whether I have cross of, whether I'm waving cross of David Garrett? Yes. Yes, I am, thank you. Okay, all right. And Mr. Hearing Examiner, this is Mr. Albright. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, uh, I have confirmed that I can waive uh, cross-examination of David Garrett. And 
Mr. Harris, you said he's available. You said that Mark Garrett is available on Wednesday afternoon. What about Wednesday morning? Uh, what I was told, and I haven't been in direct contact with him, is that he would be available tomorrow afternoon. Okay. Uh, and Miss Yi, uh, I think you said that uh, Mr. Blank would be available Thursday or Friday. Uh, did you check about Wednesday? Mr. Hearing Examiner, I did just send uh, uh, Dr. Blank a, um, a test text message, but he hasn't responded. And yesterday I did ask about Wednesday or Thursday and he responded Thursday. So uh, it's unclear. Okay. I'm checking. I'm clarifying that right now, but uh, he hasn't answered. Uh, Ms. Nanazi, what about Mr. Sandberg? Would he be available tomorrow? He is not, but he is available Thursday morning. I did ask him about that, and he could do Thursday morning if he goes on um, first. So um, he can do that. And, he's, and he is all available all day Friday, but not in the afternoon on Thursday. And what about staff's witnesses? Uh, as I've been checking with staff as we've been having this discussion. Um, I think I've, I've previously indicated that Mr. Evans is not available Thursday morning. I think as I understand from staff, that is our only limitation on availability. So our witnesses could be available tomorrow or Thursday afternoon, um, if necessary. And Mr. Gould, are you back? Are you? Yes, I apologize. I was out in the garage with uh, visiting my motorcycle. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, our wit uh, Mr. Dauphiné is available all day Thursday, but that's the only day that he is available. So tomorrow we can uh, do uh, Mark Garrett in the, the afternoon and we could do uh, Mark Tupler and John Reynolds in the morning. I think that we could do that. Nobody, nobody's hollered at me at least yet. And, and I suppose Mr. Dr. Blank is, is a potential, but uh, confirmed right now. So why, why don't we do it that Mr. way? Excuse uh, me, Mr. Mr. Hearing Examiner. Yes. Uh, with regard to the cancellation of uh, David Garrett, I had 10 minutes there. I just would like to move five minutes of those to Dr. Blank when he's available on Thursday. So he, he would go from five to 10 minutes. Okay. Okay, so uh, tomorrow, we have, uh, I guess we start with uh, Mr. Tupler, then go to John Reynolds, and then go to Mark Garrett. Does that sound reasonable? We're, we'll make it work for us. And then on Wednesday, we have, uh, let me see. We could start with uh, Mr. Sandberg, first thing. And then uh, Mr. Dauphiné and, and then Mr. Evans in the afternoon. On Thursday, I think that would work. And somewhere in there, we'll, we'll uh, fit uh, Dr. Blank on Thursday. Unless he turns out to be available tomorrow. But we can, uh, we can determine that tomorrow. Um, does that deal with the rest of the witnesses? I think it does. That, that works for us, uh, this is Peter Gould, and I'll let Mr. Dauphiné know that he'll be up second on Thursday. Okay, so tomorrow, you. We have, tomorrow we have Mark Tupler, John Reynolds, and Mark Garrett. Thursday, we have Christopher Sandberg, uh, James Dauphiné, and Evan Evans. And, uh, and likely <clears throat> Dr. Blank in there. 
unless he can be moved into Wednesday. So does that sound all right to everyone? Works for the county. Thank you. Okay, let's go back on the record. Uh, when we were when we, we talked about witness scheduling for the next two days, and uh, and we will have uh, tomorrow uh, start tomorrow morning. Start with uh, Mark Tupler, go to John Reynolds and uh, Mark Garrett. And then uh, Thursday, we'll start with Christopher Sandberg, uh, uh, James Dauphiné, Evan Evans, and, uh, and Dr. Blank, uh, unless Dr. Blank is available on Wednesday. Then we'll fit him in on Wednesday, probably, if he is available. And we'll determine that tomorrow. Uh, is there anything else we need to talk about before we uh, conclude today? Hey, Mr. Examiner, did we address David Garrett, is he waived or? I, from what I understand, yes, he is waived. Uh, uh, everyone, everyone has uh, waived cross-examination of him, as far as I know. Thank you. I wasn't sure about whether the county was just moving five minutes from him elsewhere or whether he was waived. No, we, have, we waived, but I just wanted to move five minutes of his time to Dr. Blank. And Thank you. we will, uh, well, I suppose we could deal with his testimony now. Uh, is there any objection to uh, the admission of uh, David Garrett's testimony uh, into the record? Uh, Mr. Harris, what, what exhibit number is that? I'm not even positive. Looks like his uh, direct testimony is uh, ABCWA Exhibit 4. That's correct. Sounds correct. Is there any objection to the admission of that exhibit? No objection. Okay. ABCWA Exhibit 4 is admitted. Okay. Uh, that's it for today. We'll be back uh, tomorrow morning at uh, 9 o'clock. Thank you. Thanks.